telecommunications facility development service. Okay. So we have our, uh, it's the chapter 115 of the wireless telecommunication facilities. And we have our development services coordinator, J Jody Ferguson and tower engineering professionals, program manager, Shamari uh, Myrick. And welcome tonight. Hey, Jody. Thank go ahead. Thank you. Um, this evening we have for your consideration a wireless uh, telecommunications tower. This is a 100-foot monopole tower to be located at 520 Pigeon Valley Lane in Canton. This is in the Silver Bluff area of our county. Um, off of 110, you would turn on to Lake Drive and then turn again on to Pigeon Valley and basically you go to the end of the road and then kind of up on the mountain. It is on a low ridge on the property, so it is not a protected ridge. Um, the application um, with their tree height canopies, et cetera, could ask for a maximum height of 127 feet, but this application is asking for the 100-foot monopole. Um, it is greater than one mile to the closest other tower, and this um, tower would be to increase coverage and eliminate gaps in the service. So, um, Jody, if you could pull that microphone and speak right into it. There you go. Sorry about that. Is that better? There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Do I need to repeat anything? No, no, it's okay. Okay. And then we have Shamari Myrick here. He's with Tower Engineering Professionals representing U.S. Cellular with a short presentation for you. Okay. Go ahead. Welcome. Appreciate you coming tonight. Uh, thank you. Good evening. Again, my name is Shamari Myrick, and I'm with uh, Tower Engineering Professionals. And, uh, I'm representing uh, U.S. Cellular. Uh, Jody uh, pretty much covered everything on this slide. Uh, basically, this is just giving you a, a, another overview of the, the tower's location, the height, the proposed height. And this tower is uh, going to be used to address uh, coverage gaps in the area, as well as uh, add greater uh, network density and capacity uh, for, for United States Cellular. Uh, right here, we, this is just an area of the site, just to give you a bearings of where we're proposing to locate the site. Uh, again, this is uh, Piscow Drive and uh, Crusoe Road, and this is uh, northeast of that intersection. Uh, you can also see that this is somewhat of a wooded area in here, so it's not directly adjacent to anybody's home or anything like that. Um, this, the next slide is a, um, comes from this, the site plan that we submitted to the county for review. Uh, just to point out a couple things on the site plan, uh, the access road would be a 30-foot uh, uh, utility easement to gain access, access to the property. Uh, and that will be uh, coming off of uh, Pigeon Valley Lane. Uh, my estimate, the nearest uh, house or uh, dwelling is more than 600 feet away, uh, uh, as well as the nearest property line, as you can see identified here, is 217 feet away. There is a, uh, we did designate a 100-foot fall zone area for the tower as well and the tower will be enclosed within a uh, 60 by 60 uh, compound. Uh, out of that particular property, uh, we're only leasing a 100 by 100 uh, foot area. Uh, so we, we don't utilize the entire property, just that 100 by 100 uh, leased area. Um, the next slide, uh, this is showing uh, the elevations for the tower. Uh, the overall tower height is 107 feet, and that's including a seven-foot lightning rod that we had to install at the, at the top of the tower. Um, one thing I will, will point out here, the, the plans that we uh, submitted to the, the county shows uh, only two carriers uh, being able to co-locate on this tower. Uh, which is uh, county code, uh, but on these, this set of plans that I had, I guess these, this was an earlier version, I had a, a notation of three, but we're only going to be able to support two on this uh, uh, particular uh, monopole tower. And per your code, the, these uh, antennas will be flush mounted uh, to the monopole uh, tower. 
we always like to point out the benefits. Of course, the benefits are increased uh, coverage as well as network density. Um, also, increased support for EMS uh, and E911 e locate services. If there is an emergency, a lot of times uh, uh, E911 will utilize these towers to triangulate positions of cell phones to locate individuals in the, in, in the case of any type of emergency where the individual can't share their location. So this would also enhance those capabilities for your E911 uh, services. Uh, and again, there, this tower will support two additional carriers. Uh, so whoever else wants to come in and, and co-locate on this tower will be able to do so uh, with some type of agreement with USL. And that pretty much concludes my presentation. Uh, are there any questions? Guys, do we have any questions for Mr. Myrick? Have you been able to talk to the neighbors surrounding there and the, and the individual that, I mean, obviously the individual you own, you've dealt with. Have you, have you seen any issues with it so far? No, we are required to uh, send out notices to all of the surrounding property owners, and we did uh, send out those notices. Uh, I believe Jody said that she did uh, receive uh, some neighbor inquiries, uh, just one, if I'm not mistaken, uh, but not me directly. I haven't received it. I had three, um, I had three inquiries. I had two people come by the office, want to look at the plans, see the location, that sort of thing, and then um, one by phone slash email. I didn't have any follow-up questions from any of those individuals um, once they had a chance to review the plans and ask about the location on the property. Um, I guess you chose to have the 100-foot monopole, but, the, but the, uh, the ordinance allows for higher than that. Why did you choose to go at 100 feet? Oh, well, uh, the, the RF specialists, uh, they were able to meet their desired uh, RF <clears throat> propagation. Basically, they were able to maximize their, their, the range that they were looking to cover with 100 feet as opposed to going a little bit higher with 127 feet. So okay. they basically tell us what height they can operate at based off of the information that we provide them based off of the jurisdiction's restrictions. Okay, so the co-location is not that important. Then it just looks like to me if you went higher, you could co-locate co the three as opposed to just the two. That's correct. Uh, but with the co-location, we're more so just trying to meet the county's requirements as opposed to uh, more so uh, making it suitable for other carriers. So we want, okay. we have to meet the, the county's requirements, so that's why we uh, uh, show those two spaces that, that uh, other carriers can co-locate on that pole as well. So. Okay. All right. Thank you. you uh, does your company ever entertain offering space on your tower for local 911 equipment, their personal radio equipment? We. We have sometimes issues in our county with coverage, and we're kind of out of pocket on our own on providing towers and our communication system. And it it would just make sense to me to consolidate that. But does your company ever provide space for local county EMS and 911 radio equipment? I know, and uh, and it, we would have to take that back to United States Cellular and see uh, if they were open to do, doing that. Um, I know in the past they have been open to uh, allowing uh, counties to locate those type of services uh, on their tower. Um, I don't know, I couldn't speak to what, what that agreement would look like, but um, I, I would have to take that back to them and get feedback from them to see uh, if they would be willing to do that in this instance. The last tower we approved the company that put it up they wanted to go uh, with a like an artificial pine tree type design. Does your company do that also? Uh, well, if if it was required by code, we would. Um, with this particular design, we uh, pretty much designed it based off what was required in the in the code. Um, so I think there was a stipulation in there with the tree canopies, and uh, that's kind of factored into the height of the tower and. And, and how we designed it with the, the flush mount antennas and, and that sort of thing. But as far as a um, monopine, uh, that wasn't a requirement that uh, I saw in the code. I, 
can speak to that just a little bit. Um, if they do the flush mount antennas where the antennas will not come more than two feet off the frame of the monopole, then the monopine is not required in our chapter 115 of the ordinance. But if they want to have antennas that are greater than that, then it does have to be disguised as the monopine. Thank you. Anybody else have any other questions? Okay. Okay, thank you, Jody. Okay, so we we will have a public comment session on this tower at this time. And then later on we'll have our regular public comment session for those of you who have signed up. But would anyone like to speak as to the tower uh, that is being contemplated to being put up at this time? Okay. What? Well, uh, yeah, you, you need to come forward to the mic. Uh, not a comment, just a question. Um, I, for one thing, I'd like to say I really appreciate our Board of Commissioners. I remember four years ago when it was quite different and the status of our county was quite different. So I do appreciate that. But I have a question, and that is uh, somehow could you guys publish a statement or something that shows what type of research you've looked at and what determines whether or not you're going to recommend either or both of these uh, proposals tonight? That's just a question. Could you, is that done or can that be done? Well, it, this was in their packet. People can review it in the, uh, in the uh, you know, when we publish the agenda, the, uh -huh. this attachment is there for people to review and to look at. And then also the neighbors have been contacted about uh, you know, if you're in, within a certain area, I don't know what that is. Jody could probably say what it is, but um, they're contacted by letter. I know I have a, I had a piece of property last time that was within a, a range, and so I had gotten a letter. Mm -hmm. And so they can come in and, and speak, and I believe somebody else was wanting to speak. So My point uh, is, is I don't know enough about either one of these proposals to really voice an opinion. I was just trying to pick y'all's brains, what you have found out. I know oh, you okay. have a lot of access to information that I don't, and I would just like to have something in hand that shows what you guys have considered and kind of what what you're leaning toward before. Well, I, th I think, as far as I know, whenever someone wants to propose a tower, a cell phone tower, we pretty much, we, we have to follow our ordinance, and then we pretty much have to let it let it come because that's F, that's FFA late law, I believe, or whatever whatever governs it. Where's Frank at? Oh, Frank, did the, you? Okay. I, I can speak to it. There's, a, there's an ordinance that prescribes cell towers and what you can do and the rules and regulations in Haywood County, and that is in our ordinances, and that ordinances, those ordinances are online for anyone to look up at any point in time. Mm -hmm. And that's what uh, this gentleman who is proposing it, he's looked at the guidelines and he's proposing right. this cell tower and it is in compliance with those guidelines. Okay, well I couldn't hear anything that was said, yeah. so I'm just flying blind here, but uh, if it's in the ordinance and it, com and it complies to the ordinance, then it's an automatic yes? Most of the time. Pretty much, yeah. Okay. Yeah, right. pretty much because because of the federal regulations. Okay. Yeah, we have to. Like say, it. oh, Bill Davis. Uh, I again, I don't know all these things. Okay, that's okay. Uh, but I do <laughs> thank you guys for your service, and I'm certainly glad to see the results. Okay. Okay, ma'am, you can come up. Come on up to the microphone. For. Are you talk, we're talking about for this public hearing for the wireless telecommunication tower. Do you want to speak to that? Yeah, you can come up right now. <laughs> yeah, you didn't need to sign up to speak. I mean, you've been, you know, you can or cannot, so we, we, we allow you. I have three minutes, five minutes, what is it? Yeah, you can go ahead. Okay. I, I won't limit you since it's the tower ordinance. We okay. do on public comment, though. But go. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for having this hearing. My name is Valerie Hubbard, and I'm here to speak on the proposed new cell tower. It, I think there's two, or is there one? one. Just one in class. Just one. Okay. Yeah, and just speak into the mic if you would right okay. there. Okay, so, sorry yeah. about that. That's okay. Uh, my family moved here recently, and we know firsthand the effects of, the damaging health effects of RF radiation, and specifically moved to this area to recover our health from that damage from the Greenville area, which has just rolled out 5G technology. I started the first Stop 5G group in South Carolina and have now started one here in Waynesville called Stop 5G Waynesville. 
Dr. Anthony Miller, cancer researcher, studied both ionizing and non-ionizing radiation from RF and concluded that it was a type 2A probable human carcinogenic. In 2017, the Bioinitiative Report was presented to the World Health Organization. It was written by 14 scientists in over 40 countries with 230 doctors and scientists signing it. They called for a moratorium on 5G due to the fact that RF levels they were already being exposed to have been proven to cause biological harm to humans and to the environment. 5G rollout cannot happen without more and more cell towers being built across this country. The cell phone industry is a multi-billion dollar behemoth and it spends $100 million a year lobbying Congress for more funds and power to strip away local citizens and municipalities from having a say as to whether or not we are going to be exposed to more of this. The industry is also not insured, and they know this. Lloyds of London, the oldest business insurer in the world, refused to cover them or the 5G technology because of health risks potential. 5G is not an upgrade to a t totally but a new system that's untested technology using millimeter waves used only before by a military for crowd dispersion and control. This here I bring up is a letter of liability that was presented and created by a lawyer from Australia that was passed around to citizens all over the country of Australia and sent to their um, local officials to not only educate them on the risks of RF radiation but also 5G. And because of this letter, they effectively stopped the roll G, rollout of 5G across Australia. I'm asking you to educate yourself on this topic and stand courageously to do the same for us here. I would encourage you all to look at the award-winning documentary by independent science, not industry science, called Generation Zapped. This is science proving the health dangers of RF radiation and EMF exposure to our children who are the most vulnerable and also everyone. I'd encourage you also to go to reputable independent scientific sites to learn more in order to protect our families and our community. EnvironmentalHealthTrust.org is a reputable site. AmericansForSafeTechnology.com as well as the 5G Summit. And lastly, I would just say, please also look up the Bioinitiative, report yourself and read it. Um, this is a copy. I brought 20 copies if anybody wants one here. And I would just ask you, I love that you have the Ten Commandments. That's part of why I moved to the self, to raise my children in a place that was free and that honored God, and where there was a hope of having politicians and um, elected officials who would fear God and do right and stand up for the constitutional liberties and freedoms that we all possess. And I would just leave you with Micah 6, 8, which says, what does the Lord require of you to but to do justice and love mercy and walk humbly with your God. I pray you do that. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Would anyone else like to speak to the communications ordinance? I mean, the tower. Yeah, yeah, come on up. And just state your name, maybe where you're from. Good evening, commissioners and attendees. Uh, my name is Linda Sexton, and I live in Waynesville. And uh, the, the uh, cell tower um, installation um, interests me in that it is an environmental concern, which I've come to you tonight with another environmental concern, which is noise. So similar to the noise situation, I feel that maybe a suggestion would be um, the gentleman that asked about what research is done uh, prior to things like this getting installed. Perhaps some kind of um, environmental engineer would be appropriate to study the location that this cell tower is being proposed just to, uh, you know, to accumulate some data of what are the potential risks to those that are around this uh, tower. Um, and also uh, it, just to gather some more research um, as opposed to putting the need out there to businesses and having them respond without really 
doing our own county research to find out is this really what we want to get into. So, thank okay. you. All right. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak to the tower? Okay, I'll, no, seeing no one, I'll close the public comment on that. Uh, I will say that, uh, did we have somebody else? Oh, yeah, yeah, come on up, come on up. Sorry, Mr. Myrick, I didn't see you. Let's uh, check real quick. This, this uh, tower, the proposed antennas on this tower are not 5G. Yeah, this I, is I, your I, standard 4G uh, right. build out. Um, as well as to the environmental concerns, um, we had to sum submit uh, documents to NEPA uh, before we can build any tower. So the 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 federal government regulates all of our all the towers uh, throughout the United States. So anything that that is environmentally <coughs> concerned or anything like that, we have to uh, submit those documents to the federal government, and we have those documents if need be that we need to submit it to. Uh, the commission. So, you, you 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 submitted them to who? What was the acronym you used? Uh, NEPA. Um, what is it? It's uh, <laughs> a, a National Environmental Protection Agency. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. okay. Yeah, I was gonna I was gonna elaborate that uh, we don't we don't ever foresee having five five G in Haywood County. So, uh, because evidently, I think David, you were saying that it's we don't have enough people or enough. Yeah, so we just we just have David was just saying we don't have we just have three G and four G we don't. Okay, so five G is not really just just for y'all to leave your fears. Five G is not being considered probably any time in the near future. So. Okay, thank but you. thank you for clarifying that, sir. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll, does anyone else want to speak to the tower? Okay, I'll, I'll close that portion of, and we'll be voting on this next, at our next meeting, uh, which will be, at our next meeting in December will be an organizational meeting, and we will not conduct any business, and we will probably vote on this at our second meeting in December. Is that right, Bryant? Okay, we'll move on to I mean to uh, public comment session. I have uh, uh, s several people here signed up to speak, and I'll take them in the order that they ha that I have them. You have uh, three minutes to speak. Uh, audience may not address the board at any time during uh, deliberations in next, unless recognized by the chairman. Uh, but if you will, you have three minutes to speak, and then Tracy will let you know. And if you would, just finish up your comments. I won't c cut you off cold and hard or anything. So if you would, just finish up your comment. And there's hand sanitizer if you want to, uh, and uh, wipes if you want to wipe the microphone there. So feel free to do that if you'd like. And our first person to sign up to speak is Bill Davis. So, Bill, did you want to speak? He's not listening. <laughs> did you want to speak for public comment? I had a I was told that there was also the consideration of uh, using the Clyde Armory and getting a grant to convert that into some sort of a COVID center. Is that not right? Mm, well, we're, we're getting, we, we really don't go back and forth, but we are getting a grant to, uh, to uh, remove the asbestos and lead from the armory. And one of the uses for that will be a shelter in case we have a, a storm or something because of the social distancing that we have. We have to have, if it's a storm or, you know, every, occasionally we have to have people in the shelter. And so it would just provide more room for a, a COVID shelter because of the social distancing and everything. What we were using before was the old uh, Walmart, which is where Health and Human Services are located, was that lobby. And that's what we used the last time. It's just a small area. So we were hoping to get a grant to just to clean that building. Uh, we're, we're primarily going to use that for an EMS base and uh, classrooms and uh, what else was it, Brian? It's it's got some applications after after COVID goes away. Uh, you know, we are uh, hoping that we could use the the drill hall as as 
for BLET training with the community college. That's right. Uh, we could also offer uh, indoor uh, rec programs. Uh, we are going to locate an EMS space there. Uh, it has uh, adequate space for, for uh, sheltering. Uh, the number of people that we could shelter at our current facility is down because of COVID regulations. So this gives us a way to, to serve the community in, in several different uh, fashions. So then you're not, not you're not looking at it as a specific COVID right. internment or whatever no. you might want to call no, it. No, that's no. the that's the word that was out, and no. I didn't even see it on your agenda. So okay. I apologize for that. Just a question I had because, uh, especially in this county, with the monthly death rate we have being two thirds of one ten thousandth of one percent, uh, seems to me like COVID is kind of uh, it's serious, but it's overblown. So I was hoping this was not tying into that. Okay. All right. Thank, Thank you. Okay. Our next person to sign up to speak is Melanie Williams. Okay. Welcome, Melanie. Hi, my name is Melanie Williams. I have a similar comment. So um, I was looking at the application that you guys submitted and for the armory and it did say it was specific coronavirus scenarios like that's the grant itself so i just wanted to speak to that um, so and according to the wlos article um, it did say that the commissioners are considering using the clyde armory as an emergency covid 19 shelter so if that is incorrect then something needs to be cleared up um, but you know as far as COVID-19 goes, it's brought so many changes to our way of life, and one of the most significant changes is in what the word quarantine means. So prior to this illness, quarantine always meant sequestering people who had an active illness. They had symptoms, but as of COVID-19, we've completely changed our perspective, and now COVID-19 applies to quarantining everyone, every person, every age, every health status and we're seeing that continuing to perpetuate itself in our reactions michigan just went into a three-week lockdown of the entire population chicago's in shelter in place washington has no gathering with people outside your household unless they have quarantined for 14 days and tested negative um, we've got curfews in greece italy spain belgium and portugal in france every person that leaves their house has to carry papers to justify their journey um, Greece, people need to get a text approval before they leave their house. Italy has instituted colored zones that determine whether you're able to leave or not. They have a nationwide curfew. Canada has um, created internment camps in every providence and are, they are not limited to just people who have COVID. They've openly stated that it can be used for anybody in the population. The government of New Zealand has announced that all COVID-19 infected citizens and possibly close relatives with them will be taken and placed in mandatory quarantine facilities. So, so my concern is with the money that you're getting from the federal government to convert this facility being tied to COVID, if you look at the CDC, they've got a policy called Interim Operational Considerations for implementing the shielding approach to prevent COVID-19 infections and the facility that you guys are getting ready to re, you know, renovate with federal funding around the coronavirus issue will be considered one of these green zone facilities. It's spelled out on the CDC's website. And so um, their plan there is to isolate anyone who is COVID positive or who is at risk. And at risk people can be people who refuse to mask up, who refuse to take a COVID vaccine, or refuse to follow any of the stipulations that have put, been put into effect. So I'm finishing up. In a world where the golden key to resuming life is wearing a mask, testing, or vaccinating, what happens to those of us who aren't going to comply with those measures to resume our lives? And when you are talking about creating a facility within our own community where people who are considered high risk will be sheltered, how can we feel protected from what's going on in other countries when we see that America is walking in lockstep with the global response to COVID-19? It's a pretty significant concern. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Okay, our next person to sign up to speak is Jill, is it Wasker? 
And if I mispronounce that, I'm sorry. But welcome, Jill. Swaski. Hi. <clears throat> I'm also here to, to address the National Guard Arm Armory Facility and um, the fact that this is being called a disaster, COVID-19. I'm not sure that it warrants that. Um, and disaster fraud is when public funds set aside for actual bona fide disasters are used for other unauthorized purposes or taken under false claims of a disaster. When a person is found guilty of disaster fraud, they are subject to seizure of bonds, arrest, imprisonment, and civil damages for the fraud and waste of public funds and resources. If this grant money is awarded, then it would be taxed and the citizens would pay, be pay, paying taxes on that. Um, the CDC has made available to the public their plans to implement shield, the shielding approach for the purpose of limiting contact between individuals at risk for COVID-19. This is exactly the purpose of the facility that we're here to discuss tonight and several other citizens have come to speak out against this. In other countries, we are already seeing individuals being isolated from their families for 14 days or longer with no ability to have contact with one another. In Singapore, where they do have these facilities up and running, they are is isolating very low risk individuals. And I have a medical journal here that I'd like to read from. It says that the group of patients was considered low risk they were chosen for admission to the, to the facility. They were generally young and had no severe symptoms, no serious medical comorbid conditions, normal vital signs, and a news score of four or less. That is a composite based on respiratory rate, oxygen saturation, supplemental oxygen requirement, temperature, blood pressure, heart rate, and level of consciousness. So basically, are, these are healthy people that are being taken into these facilities and isolated. Um, the public needs to be aware of exactly what might be involved in having a facility in our area of this caliber. And I'm asking you if this is really representative of what our citizens want or need. Thank you, Jill. Our next person signed up to speak is Stephanie Parsons. Welcome, Stephanie. Hi, my name is Stephanie Parsons. And first, I want to start off by reading our North Carolina State Constitution, Section 2. All political power is vested in and derived from the people. All government of right originates from the people, is founded upon their will only, and instituted solely for the good of the whole. I think that's really important right now because what we're experiencing is a lot of tyranny in our country. We are following a global pandemic, as I like to call it, because the things that they are saying that we are experiencing and that we will need places like quarantines or vaccines, that is not constitutional. That is not protecting the people. These things have not been tested. Let's talk about vaccines really quick. My son was injured by vaccines. He had bad reactions at nine months. He went into convulsions and cephalopathy. In that moment, I realized that I had to go into every single vaccine insert and read them. I realized that there are neurotoxins, carcinogens, and foreign DNA in every single one of them. That HHS was sued in July of 2018, specifically because they never did a safety study in the past 32 years. That is a problem. A bigger problem is that one in five, one in five children in America have a learning disability. That means that 17% of every 35 students in a classroom cannot understand truly what the teacher is saying. They have ADD, they have ADHD, they have um, learning disabilities like speech delay and so on. My son didn't speak until after he was two and a half and I had to do a lot of detoxing to get him to that point. When my one year old, who had only had one thing which was the vitamin K shot, ended up speaking and teaching my son many things. This COVID-19 vaccine is very interesting. Where do we get the name COVID from? CO, carbon oxygen. 
to or V, vaccine, ID. That's a problem for me. Because when you look at the book of Revelations and you pull that out and you read about the mark of the beast, you read about the Moderna vaccine and the luciferase that's in it. Do you guys know what luciferase is? Luciferase is a hydrogel. It's a light. There's a light tattoo within it, which means that they can check your skin to see if you have your vaccine ID. That's a problem for me because nothing is going to be injected into my body, into my children's body, or to the constituents of the state bodies that have not been truly tested. Operation Warp Speed is not acceptable. Whenever they took 32 years and they couldn't even do a safety study on a DTaP, on a Tdap, on a, um, let's talk, actually the DPT vaccine. There is a study by Peter, Dr. Peter Abe that they did, a 22-year study in New Guinea, Africa, I believe, and it was 22 years they realized that the DPT vaccine that they moved from the United States of America in 1986 because it was killing so many children and, ma and mangling them, they sent it to Africa and they gave it to those children. They realized, you know what, I don't know if we're saving more kids right now or if we're harming them. They found out that every 2.1 million children die each year due to that vaccine that America sent to Africa. That's a problem. And now we're talking about a COVID-19 vaccine. We're segregated in here. We're on the left, they're on the right because they're wearing masks. Carbon dioxide is poisonous. It is toxic to the human being. It is like taking a plant, putting a covering over it and saying, this is for your health. What will happen to that plant? That plant will die. This is inhuman. It is unnatural to the way that we live. Germs are okay. The chemicals and the ingredients in this is going to harm your skin more than any virus. A virus is not alive. What did they used to tell you about a virus? That, oh, you just had to get it, you get over it because you can't kill a virus. Your body's made of more bacterial cells and human cells than it is, or more bacterial cells and viruses than it is human cells. That's huge. That's a big thing. That means if you're putting antibacterials all over your skin, which is your largest organ, you are killing yourself. You are putting your immune system in a suppressed state. You are not helping yourself. The fear of the pandemic is not helping anyone, but what it is bringing is tyranny. And that is not okay in the state that we said we were first in freedoms, right? Let's stop the mask mandates. Let's not bring in any vaccine mandates. Because you know, it really, really bothers me when I go to a door and I see no mask, no service. And you know what makes me realize is that's just the same segregation. It's the same thing as the race baiting of no whites here, no blacks here, this and that. It's no different. It's the same ideology. You cannot segregate people from each other. That's inhuman. We are human beings and we are natural to this earth. And if we believe in that Ten Commandments, then we need to listen to every single person's testimony. There are thousands upon thousands upon millions of children and elderly that will be harmed by that COVID-19 vaccine or by quarantines. We can no longer allow this. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, our next person signed up to speak is Linda Sexton. Welcome, Linda. That's a tough act to follow. Um, sorry. <laughs> Just clean the microphone. Good evening, commissioners and attendees and any neighbors that may be here. When people are pushed too far, pushed far beyond what they can tolerate as reasonable human beings. Picket lines form, protesters gather, marches take place, lawsuits develop, and in extreme cases, riots and vandalism ensue. None of those tonight, I assure you. But tonight I deliver another form of protest a petition, a protest against the earth-shaking noise 
we've been forced to endure within our homes from the newly named Smoky Mountain Event Center. We realize this petition carries very little weight legally, but with over a hundred signatures, it paints a clear picture of a very large and expanding area affected by loud music coming from the SMEC. This area is not restricted to Regina Park and Foxfire 1 and 2 neighborhoods. We present today, but will continue gathering signatures until we have found every resident who is negatively impacted by the loud sound systems and concerts held at the SMEC. We came to you on October 19th, and some of us another meeting after that, with a very serious community concern and shared disturbing personal experiences. We were met with responses that left us feeling our problem was made light of and with the idea that it was our responsibility to fix it. We were told things like, we have to go through things in life that are uncomfortable. It was hinted that we might be okay with it if it helps the community. Well, there's no data to support the assumption that these concerts provide any economic benefit to the county. None whatsoever. Not all the hotels and gas stations benefit. Transylvania County is now facing the concert-associated problems at the Cannon Golf Course, and they've stated, quote, economic benefit is negligible. Additionally, their Board of Commissioners is addressing the ordinance for mass gatherings because these concerts have potential to be COVID-19 super spreaders. I... Do I get five minutes? It's a group. I wrote it down there, all three neighborhoods. I'm sorry, two more minutes. You can go ahead a couple more minutes for speaking for the it, There's not much left. Um, I had a conversation <laughs> with Sparkles at one of the um, Asheville Music Hall concerts about wearing a face mask. And Sparkles Sit over six feet tall with a long beard and a lot of tattoos, very intimidating character. And he looked at me and he said, ain't gonna happen. No one inquired as to how these concerts would impact the surrounding communities before they started. No one consulted us. We should have been considered. But we did offer a solution at our October 19th meeting we requested the very outdated Haywood County Noise Ordinance be completely revised. It's time to protect all citizens. And we requested the loud outdoor concerts and indoor sound systems be prohibited. An acoustic engineer is clearly needed in the county to assist in making recommendations for a new noise ordinance and to move Haywood County into a future with growth. There will be more noise issues to come elsewhere. The engineer could study the topography and building structure of the SMEC to determine what events can be held there without disturbing residents from Lake Junaluska County Road to Regina Park and beyond. A, professional, a professional's research will prove the SMEC, or may prove, the SMEC is not the appropriate venue for loud concerts and indoor sound systems, but a more appropriate venue for other activities. As our elected officials, your first and foremost priority should be your residents, all of them, all the time. Imagine if the President of the United States said, I can't worry about Rhode Island, I have 49 other states. We may seem like the tiny state of Rhode Island, in the scheme of things, but we represent and support Haywood County 24-7, 52 weeks per year, 365 days per year. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, attendees. Thank you, Linda. It's off. Oh. I would just send that to Tracy. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay. 
Okay, our next person signed up to speak, I believe, is Joseph Thomas. If I mispronounced your name, I'm sorry. Welcome, Joseph. Hello, my name is Joseph Thomas, and I just want to say thanks for your willingness to serve our county. And I know that uh, <clears throat> you guys are placed in a, in a really difficult spot in a lot of ways because you're trying to meet the needs of everyone in the county. But I think it's important that um, we, need to, we need to take a pause on, on our reactions to this year in particular. And um, a lot of the county is fearful for good reason. Um, I'm a business owner. I have two two boys that I'm homeschooling. I'm active in the church when we had church. And now, of course, you know where we are country-wise. We don't even talk about that. But <clears throat> this is my first meeting here. I've lived here for eight years. I've been to two town board meetings. There are things that have happened there where, where the language has been changed and they're giving one person the power to, to basically control our county. They're going to say, well, you know, you, we're going to shut this down for emergency purposes, whatever one person seems deemed. And I don't know too many people. That, I mean, I, w I would never want that situation for a lot of reasons to have one person in charge in that manner. I end up hearing about the quarantine. Um, I am not wearing a mask today because um, I'm not fearful. We, this is the image of God. This covers the image of God. And for anybody that believes those Ten Commandments, you know who God is. And I believe this whole mask thing is the is a antichrist movement. That this is a spiritual war that we're in. And you and those who are not blind, they, they know this. So I just say that um, I've met with, I came out of the second meeting not being able to speak at the, uh, the I went to two meetings, I wasn't able to speak. I'm thankful for this forum and your willingness to listen. This, listen. But um, the Holy Spirit does a whole lot of things. I walk out and the Holy Spirit says, talk to this man. I don't know who this is, but I introduced myself because I was told to. And it's our police chief. And he and I, we get to talk in two minutes. He's like, I know you from somewhere. You know, when the police chief, you're like, oh, I've never met you before. How, do we, how, how, how so? Come to find out, we actually went to school together. And so we, we ended up meeting. And uh, man, I tell you, God has appointed each and every one of you for a time just such as this. And the police, we've met with the, with the uh, chief of police. And you understand the predicament that probably happened this past Tuesday without me going into it. But we ended up, um, and, I'll, and I'll round this up, we ended up also meeting with a sheriff. But there's key questions that we must ask our authority. If you look at any research whatsoever that's happening right now in Canada, where they're using their law enforcement to pull people out of homes to, to be quarantined, this is a real concern, real scare that's happening. They're very, very fearful. They want to move to Texas. You know, they have no guns up there, too, and they're, they're pleading. They're, like, wanting to come to our country, you know, by their droves. So I have posed both these questions to law enforcement to both sides. And, you know, as you know, the Clyde location is already shortchanged. They're already having to cover costs. I think it's important that you, we ask our law enforcement, how are we going to pay for this, you know, Who's going to man this? Who's going to actually be the one to implement having to enforce force that? And um, I, I certainly, I just wanted to, to come tonight to let you to know that I'm not in favor of that because I believe anytime you take free money, especially from our government, that gives them the ability to put troops on the ground someday. And how many times have we seen things that started out with a good intention and then it backfired just as the enemy has planned all along. So I, I'm just, uh, I thank you again for the time, and I just, I wanted to go on record just to say that I, I certainly oppose it, and I just, you know, a lot of people have uh, faith in this, 
you know, this vaccination, which I would never do that. And I would never, ever do that. But some people believe in that. So why not just let this thing unwind itself? Why would you ever want to put a permanent building up if you know that masks are going to eventually go away, right? We're, we've leveled the curve. We have n no real urgent matter here as of COVID in, compared to other places. Why not just let that wind down and then see what we can do? But I really would urge you to refrain from borrowing money that would allow them, them to, to use. We don't want to open up this beautiful c country that we have here in Haywood County for anything like that. So anyways, that's all I've got to say. Thank you, Joe. Okay. Thank you, Joe. <clears throat> Thank you, Joseph. And our next person to, stand up, uh, to sign up to speak is Janet Presson. Welcome, Janet. Good evening, I'm Janet Presson. I live here in Haywood County. Um, I've spoken with you many times before, and actually a bunch of us were at dinner last night and started talking about this Canton Armory thing. That's why there's so many questions tonight. I went online today trying to figure out what, what all went along as far as requirements if we take that money, and it wasn't real clear. I'm all for renovating and repurposing government buildings. I mean, we, they belong to us, and if we can put them to good use as shelters or homeless shelters or something else, I'm all for that. Um, I hate to see buildings go to waste, but we really do need to make certain before we accept that money, if we're selected, that we know exactly the obligations that come with it. Um, I've spoken in the past about the contradictory or confusing guidance from our health department, North Carolina DHHS, the CDC, etc., on masks, social distancing, and other COVID issues. The latest questions I have, okay, we've got a huge push as we do every year, flu shots. Same as every year, get the flu shot, it will save your life, you won't get the flu. And um, most still contain mercury, which is the second most toxic substance on the planet and a known neurotoxin. And we do have such a huge population now with dementia, Alzheimer's, autism, and other neurological disorders. I mean, you know, where is all that coming from? It's, it's, some of it is the neurotoxins. Um, don't our masks protect us from the flu? If we're wearing that mask, I mean, is it only, is it only a COVID mask or is it a... COVID and flu and other things mask. You know, you, you shouldn't need a flu shot, I would think, if you're wearing a mask all the time. Couldn't our health department save scarce dollars this year by skipping the flu shot clinics if we're all wearing masks? And some years the efficacy is not very high anyway. Dr. Fauci just said that even after we all get the COVID vaccine, which you know, we've already stated a bunch of us are not gonna take it, but if everybody did in fact get the COVID vaccine, he says we still are going to need to wear masks and social distance. Now, why is that? Is the vaccine not going to work? And there's been at least two documented cases of people who had COVID who caught it again. So if you don't get immunity from catching and recovering from the virus, what makes you think the vaccine is going to confer immunity? I have huge concerns with what we're seeing in other states and around the world with new shutdowns, being mandated to wear masks. We're being told in other states when the vaccine is available, they're going to mandate it. And I'm afraid that's going to happen here if we don't fight it now and make, you know, make it clear we're not going to do that. Limits on the number of participants on, at social gatherings and in our own homes at Thanksgiving and Christmas, that's not the government's business. Um, this is a real slippery slope, and I ha hope Haywood County does not go down that slope. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Janet. Uh, Janet was the last one signed up to speak. Would anyone else like to address the board tonight? No. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> No, no, she I, said, no, no. He said, Linda, you've already, you already had three minutes and five minutes, so. <laughs> so. Are you on that topic? No. You can. <laughs> you can. That's okay. That's all right. No. Yeah. You want her to come up? Well, if she hadn't signed up, she can still speak. She right. signed up and spoke. The light, the light, no, the this light, the light, the light in the brown jacket. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't sign up. 
<laughs> no, no, you can come. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Linda, but we, we just, yeah, I'm sorry. Honestly, I wear a mask because I don't want to have anybody harass me for not wearing a mask. That's okay. But I'm, I'm well, also state, state here. Your, state your name, maybe where you're from. Uh, well, I'm, my name is Wendy Billeray, and I'm here from in Haywood County. Okay. Um, I moved my children here 28 years ago, and for 28 years we have gone to the Haywood County Fairgrounds for good, wholesome entertainment. I live approximately a thousand square feet, a thousand feet from the fairgrounds. I walk there, been to every flea market, fair, tractor pull, and occasionally in my backyard I hear a little bit of music coming, wafing up into my backyard. Um, I built my house there 18 years ago. I lost it at the economic crash, and I almost lost it again from the COVID, and I fought very hard to, to hang on to my home and to keep my home. And last month, I was assaulted in my own home with this noise coming up from the Smoky Mountain Event Center. It was, it's not music. It's this techno blast, beating, crazy stuff. And my quiet enjoyment is absolutely trashed. I go to bed at 8.30 at night so that I can get up and, and work to hang on to my home. And they are playing music during the week on weeknights, and I'm, I'm subjected to staying up until 10 o'clock at night to listening to this. I mean, it's not even good bluegrass, people. It's not good music. It's from an Asheville promotion company that lost their venue, that brought what they think is good music here to Haywood County. And let me tell you, it is not. I have been so frustrated and so angry by the time it's finished. I have called and I have complained because it's, it's not the proper venue. This has been a beautiful, quiet, safe neighborhood. Now I have these cars driving through my neighborhood, people, strange people walking around through my neighborhood, and I'm just here to say that I do not like that music. It is not appropriate, 100% not appropriate for our neighborhood. That's four big neighborhoods that pay huge tax dollars to help you guys keep your place, and this, this is not going to bring you in the money that's going to make all of us suffer, and I really, really want you to take that into consideration. Thank you for letting me speak. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry I didn't see you. <laughs> would, would anyone else like? Okay, come on up. Yeah, just state your name and maybe where you're from. Welcome. Hello. How are you? Thank you for your time. I'm Trisha Thomas. I just wanted to have a moment to speak. I've lived in Waynesville for about seven years. From Charlotte, mainly Ohio, I travel all over. I spend a lot of time at Empire State every month. My background's in engineering design. So I do a lot of work um, in Midtown Manhattan. Um, I haven't traveled there. I was actually there when COVID hit in Midtown Manhattan, and they actually had me traveling back to the Asheville airport immediately. But I just wanted to express concern, you know, just being an engineer, um, just having the background of defining parameters, it's key. So when I'm hearing about for the first time, I just found this out and this is, you know, I'm here and I didn't even know this was occurring. I'm just concerned when you're converting, like they're talking this armory building and I'm gonna read up about that. Just defining the parameters behind that because a lot of people are going to have questions. What are you going to do with that? And if you're going to accept you know, funding, they're going to require that you have to meet obligations. So it would be nice to understand what those parameters are. So if you're going to use it for COVID, you know, what, is that? what does that entail? Are they healthy? Are they high risk? Are they people infected? That has to be clear. And then the concern is, is after COVID, then could it be converted to something else? Okay. Like, isolation, um, whatever that is. We're all concerned to maintain liberty and freedom. That is essential and vital um, to obtain our constitutional rights. And also, just as an engineer, I wanted to point this out in material science and chemical engineering. I was given this mask. The gentleman was very kind at the front um, providing this mask. But I can propagate the tear, and these are fibers. So this is mainly made from trees, like paper, but other masks other people are wearing are cotton fibers. Others are synthetic materials like rayon fibers, spandex fibers. There's different types of materials. So 
Coming from the medical industry too, you have an SOP, standard operating procedure. So everything should be standardized, material should be standardized, elastic for torquing application, removal force, everything should be standardized or it's not effective. So these are just things I wanted to just explain and even uh, transmission of paper versus cotton versus synthetic material, different where the virus can travel actually through these different masks. So I just wanted to point that out just on an engineering technical perspective. I appreciate your time and just thank you for serving. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Trish. Was there anyone else like to address the board? I see no one. I'll close the public comment session. Um, Brian, do you want to just talk about the, the shell? What, well, it's not, yeah, what we're doing with the grant. Sure. If we get uh, it. I'll ask David. He, he's he's ran a point okay. on this and, and he has the answer, details. Might answer some of their questions. So, And I appreciate everyone that came out and spoke tonight. Uh, I know it takes a lot of courage. And uh, we appreciate y'all coming out. We really do. It's good to know what's on people's minds. So, Dave, just make sure you're talking to the microphone so I can hear you, sir. <laughs> Good evening, Commissioners. Uh, what I have here is the actual grant application that uh, Will and I completed last week. Project overview. Provide a description of the proposed activity or activities and explain how each addresses the health and economic impact of COVID-19 in your community. Specifically, state how the activity pre prevents, responds, and prepares for coronavirus. The first component of the proposed project is the renovation of the vacant Haywood County Armory facility. The goal is for the Armory to be the primary dedicated emergency shelter facility in Haywood County. The Armory will serve up to 56 individuals when following COVID social distancing guidelines. Currently, during emergency events, the Human and Health Services building, which is the DSS building located in the former Walmart uh, building, uh, is retrofitted as a primary shelter facility that can only house 26 individuals when using COVID and social distancing guidelines. As the primary sheltering facility are being sheltered while staff continue to provide normal HAS assistance and services in the same facility, a secondary shelter option at the Haywood County High School is the second option. So the two options were, are both public buildings when we have an event. So just, you know, like last week, we had, you know, our third hurricane skirt through here. And so we have those events. We opened these types of shelters. In 2018, we opened an event for, a, uh, for the snow event that happened in December. We housed 52 individuals for over a week at that point in time. And so all we're doing with the Armory is having a standalone emergency shelter building. This gives us more capacity and more room than what we have at the Haywood County Health and Human Services Building. Right. This is not anything to do with, you know, COVID specifically or anything like that where we're hauling people or taking people because they have COVID there. That's far from anything from the truth. It's very simple. I'll be glad to share this. I'll be glad to post it up there if that will help uh, any of the uh, concerns there. But nothing else is about that. Yeah, can we repost that on our <coughs> website? Just from that application, then everybody can read it. Because it truly is just, you know, we had, I know in 2018, when I first became chair, the first two weeks I had to do an emergency proclamation because of a snowstorm, and we had to open a shelter. Really, I wish you hadn't used the word COVID. It should have just used a more roomy shelter. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. You know, might have been a better, better use of words, but... Um, but we can have 56 people there, is that right? Correct. Instead of the 26 that we can have now in the, uh, in the, in the lobby there. So <coughs> Correct. That's, and it's truly, and really the building, the, the Army, we're going to be using it for a lot of different things. But before we can use it, we have to get the lead and asbestos out of it so we can start using it. So that it's, that's yeah. the primary concern is just, yeah. and, and it'll be for classrooms at uh, HCC and for maybe even uh, recreation and for an EMS base. That's it's, correct. It's, that's our primary reasons for it. We just wanted to, we threw the, the, the COVID shelter in so we would hopefully give us a better chance 
because we will we can do COVID. It's really COVID social distancing. Distancing. Mm -hmm. That's the only re reason yeah. we're using the word COVID is just for social distancing during this time of COVID. And hopefully this time is going to be shorter and shorter. I hope so. That's, that's correct. Okay. Okay. Right, Any other questions? You, I, we don't. We, yeah, we don't go back and forth. But if you want to, I tell you what, David, do you, do you want to go back there and talk to, to the lady that had her hand up? Yeah, glad to. Which one? Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dave. Does anybody have any more questions for Dave? Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, let me go. I want to go over before we get uh, the Garen uh, up here. Um, does anybody have any constituent concerns? That they, that they want to speak to. Uh, Kurt, do you have anything? I, I didn't have either. The, the, these folks had constituent concerns tonight, and I think David answered the questions mainly about about the shelter and, and the need for the shelter. Um, and, I, and I hope that was explained and everyone understood the fact that we have to um, abide by the the uh, distancing guidelines. And right now, if there's a, if there's a snow this winter, and and I-40's closed, and they have to have some some place to put people, or there are people that don't have a place to stay. Right now, because of the COVID guidelines that the state provides, we can't house that many people in the shelters that we have at the Department of Health and Human Services because of the social distancing guidelines. So this grant's available to have a facility to where we'll have additional rooms and places in case there is an emergency and we can still abide by those uh, social distancing guidelines. So that's, that's the reason for the grant. Um, and, it's, and, and we've got a building that we, can't, we couldn't use because of the lead it has in it and because of the asbestos it has in it. And it has a, we have the ability to reuse the building. Now, when we repurpose the building, HCC is going to be able to use the building. We're going to be able to use it for recreational purposes. They're going to have some classrooms there. And we're going to have an EMS base there, too. So it's, it's not a facility built to go house people with COVID. I mean, that, that's not the purpose of it. So I just want to make sure that that was clear. Anything, Brad? Brandon? Uh, just Brian, to add to that. Oh, go ahead, Brian. I, I just wanted to, to mention a portion about that EMS base and why it's really critical. So we currently co-locate at Clyde Town Hall. When Town Hall closes, we locate the, the unit over to Canton, and our response times in the evenings go up. So if we get this building renovated, we can actually keep some the unit there in Clyde, center of the county, and our response times should drop about four minutes from where they currently are. Now, four minutes may not sound like a lot of time unless it's you laying on the floor waiting for a rescue squad. So this really goes a long way to serving the community, not just the shelter, not just for REC or BLET, but also when somebody calls 911, that unit's going to be a lot closer. This is a way that we are hoping to leverage state funds to offset county dollars and, and save lots of tax dollars. So we're excited about it. And keep in mind, the other portion of the grant included about $120,000 in funding for mountain projects and rental assistance to keep people in their homes uh, through the winter. So uh, while part of it is to upfit the, the facility, the other part is to keep people in their, in their homes this winter. Okay. Hey, Brandon, did you have anything? Yeah, I did think you? just to add to that as well, I know that the current location that we have, and by the way, we do we do have an emergency shelter now, which is the HHS. So all we're doing is getting this building prepared and ready so that we can house more people because of the COVID restrictions. Uh, and also, if correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Mr. Moorhead, but uh, right now we can't uh, use the showers or we don't have showers at the HHS building. And if we're housing folks overnight, we will have the showers available at the armory building, is that correct? Uh, the, the snowstorm of, of December of 18, uh, we had a lot of folks evacuate early because they were afraid of losing power and they needed it for oxygen and, and, and various things. And so we had some folks there three or four days. Hygiene is an issue at that point. Uh, having the, the armory with the shower facilities is, is gonna fix that uh, gap in service. 
I guess because of the restrictions, uh, the COVID restrictions that we have, we can't apply for this grant and get the funding to help renovate that because of the lead poisoning that's in that building. So it's a win-win situation to be able to do that. Uh, I, I also want to address uh, several of the comments about the vaccinations or the vaccines. Uh, I am on the HHS board, as most of you guys know, plus being a member of this board. I can say that we have never discussed on either board that we're going to make that mandatory. I believe it ought to be a choice uh, of the ones that want to take it. If they want to take it, that's fine. And, and I just want to go on record as saying that I am in support of it being a, uh, a person's choice and not mandating it. So I wanted you guys to hear me say that. Uh, we've never just... I have been on the board, I've talked to uh, our chairman on that board, I've talked to a lot of folks on that board, and, and I can promise you it's never been discussed and we have never discussed it as a board here as well. Uh, you know, there's a lot of folks that, that believe in the vaccinations and they want it, and that is fine. You know, if they want it, they, they can have it. So uh, uh, I've got to put my glasses back on, see if I made any more notes here. I know that Mr. Thomas, I believe it was, uh, made a comment, you know, about church, which has always been a concern of mine. I'm a Christian, a uh, big believer in going to church and worshiping our Lord. And, uh, you know, it, it has bothered me as well that we restrict people from going to church or uh, gathering for funerals or, or family gatherings or stuff like that. And, uh, but we allow them to go to places like Walmart and Lowe's and stuff like that. So I, I wanted you to know I do hear you when you say that. Uh, it, it bothers me as well. Uh, I try to be fair and a voice for everybody on this board. And I know that we represent uh, over 60,000 people in the county, and I try to do that. And I've always run uh, my campaign saying I'll be a voice for the people, and I try to do that. So when we're behind closed doors talking one-on-one -on -one or, or any of these boards I serve on, I can promise you I'll always be a voice for everyone, not just a certain group. Well, I, <clears throat> I can't really follow that. I mean, uh, that's a hard act to follow. But, uh, <laughs> well, uh, I, won't, I won't go there other than to say if you haven't seen the armory, you should go look at it. Uh, our uh, ancestors that pre preceded us uh, had a lot of wisdom when they had that written into the deed that uh, if the National Guard Armory ever ceased to use that building, it would be kicked back to the county. So that's a multi-million dollar uh, building if we had to build that today. And uh, somebody had some wisdom when they inserted that into that deed. So it did get kicked back to us. It's a brick and mortar building. It's a fabulous building. And uh, so as these other fellows have already tried to say, uh, our whole life's been disrupted. Uh, this COVID-19 has caused a lot of the speakers here tonight, if not all of them, even the music, the uh, the concerns. I'm ready for this thing to be over, and I'm sure everybody else here is too, but we just don't know when it's going to be over. And uh, I, I agree with Commissioner Rogers, personal choice, uh, get educated, make your own personal choice on things for what's best for your health. So again, we, <clears throat> we haven't discussed any of these uh, measures that uh, have instilled a lot of fright into our citizenry. So. Uh, Having said that, I will address the music. So some folks came tonight to address the, the music, and I, I don't know if you folks know, but uh, there's been an open invitation to come and sit down with some of the folks at the fairgrounds, myself included. We're having a meeting at 5 o'clock tomorrow. The Homeowners Association presidents that represent you have been invited, and they have agreed to come. So there's a few things we can do to uh, hopefully help that situation. And, and my, personally speaking, I get up about 4.45 a.m., start my work day. Those midweek uh, performances that lasted till 10 o'clock, even though they were well within the legal limits of our noise ordinance and the laws of North Carolina, I'm, I feel your pain. I personally <clears throat> think we should, uh, as a event center, we should dial that back to at least 9.30. And we're going to have a discussion about noise uh, decibel limits and things of that nature. but. 
please understand a lot of these things that we're faced with now are <clears throat> it's just like plowing new ground. Uh, you sink a plow in the ground and you might have some really nice sandy loamy soil to plow, but you might hit a big rock if you haven't plowed that ground before. And, and COVID-19 has certainly caused us to hit a few rocks. And we've, we've plowed up a few rocks and, and hopefully we can remove those and have some smooth sailing in the future. So uh, as we work through this situation, I, I do hope and pray that this thing's over with soon. Uh, but only, only God knows, only God knows. But uh, uh, on that note, <clears throat> please remember the family in uh, the North Canton community that suffered a loss as a, a tragic fire uh, Sunday night and uh, they lost a three month old. So I saw that uh, reported in the news and uh, just remember that family. And we, we love our county and, and we just hope we, we continue to represent the county in a way that uh, is pleasing and uh, we'll work through these issues. Hey, thank you, Tommy. Uh, I just wanted to let people know that, that the uh, Republican Party will be appointing a replacement for Mark Pless. Mark is not here this evening because he had to be in Raleigh, I believe. Is that right, Brian? He had to be in Raleigh. So Mark's not here because of that, but the Republican Party will be doing that appointment. And rep the Republican Party is the only ones that do that appointment, not the Board of Commissioners. I know we've gotten some emails from different people uh, asking us to appoint certain people, but the Republican Party's executive committee does that appointment and basically we, we just affirm it. So the, this board of commissioners does not have a, a, a voice, if you will, as a board on who that appointment's gonna be. So it will be uh, the uh, executive committee. So, and that committee is having a, uh, they're gonna be having a, uh, what you'd say, uh, three different, and I'll pull that up. They're gonna have three different occasions where you can meet the candidates in this room. Uh, and it'll be Saturday, November 21st at 10 o'clock for one hour. Uh, the commissioner candidates will be in the historic courtroom here. So it's Monday, November 30th at 6 o'clock and Saturday, December 5th at 11 a.m. Or, or I'm sorry, at 10 a.m. So this is for one hour each. So let me repeat that again. Saturday, November 21st at 10 a.m. for one hour. Monday, November 30th at 6 p.m. And Saturday, no December 5th at 10 a.m. So did I get that? Okay, so that will be, uh, if you want to come and see who those candidates are and ask them questions, uh, Trudy S uh, Schmidt's here tonight and she said if any of the commissioners have any questions that we would ask, that we would like uh, for her to ask, because she's going to moderate those, uh, those uh, three one-hour segments uh, to, to let her know and, and she would uh, ask those questions. So if any, any commissioner here, that includes you too, Kirk, have any questions <laughs> that you'd like to ask those candidates. <laughs> Uh, feel free to do that. So, but it will be that board making that decision. So I want everybody to know that. And as far as, and I, I'm going to take a little bit for, different take on the mask thing. I, I really wish people would wear a mask. And I think I've said it before. Um, and I don't, I don't really want to mandate that anybody, that everybody wears a mask. I, I wish people would because, uh, you know, I, I, and I, I think everybody knows I have multiple sclerosis and I'm on a treatment that has, uh, what it does is it knocks out part of my immune system and it kills some of my immune cells. And the reason it does that is because my immune cells overreact and by them overreacting, it attacks the myelin sheath on our nerves. So anyway, unfortunately, when it knocks out part of my immune system and people like me and there's other people, uh, elderly people that really don't want to get the virus and we know, I mean, we believe or I believe that wearing a mask is the best way to do that. And I know that might be what some of y'all want to hear, but but I really believe if we would all wear a mask that we could probably quell this uh, a lot quicker than we have been. Uh, and I believe, uh, and I do believe in the Ten Commandments and Jesus said, you know, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. And I think by wearing my mask, you know, I'm protecting others and I wish everyone would wear a mask so they could protect me because it makes me feel like nobody cares about my condition, if you will because, and, it, and I have elderly parents, and it makes me feel like my other people do, d does not care about my elder, elderly parents. My daughter takes care of COVID patients in the hospital. And so we, you know, I am very careful on wearing a mask because 
you know, she's, she, uh, she just sold their home in, in Georgia and they're living with us right now. So it's important for me and her to wear a mask wherever we go because she's around COVID patients all the time and her job in the hospital. So, and occasionally she does screening. So I have three really good reasons uh, that why I wish people would wear a mask and that's, and maybe I'm being selfish, but you know, being a person who uh, doesn't want to get the COVID uh, because I don't know how my body's going to react to it. I'm not strong. My, my system's not strong. And there's a lot of people out there and a lot of elderly people whose immune systems are not strong. So, you know, I, I would say I'm not, I'm not, I don't want it mandated that they wear a mask, but I would just ask that you guys would, would consider, you know, wearing a mask because it is, uh, you know, I believe it does prevent it. You know, the CDC has said that wearing a mask is as effective as a vaccine. And I know it's probably not 100%, but it's a whole lot more percent. I know when a surgeon does a surgery, he wears a mask. And he wears a mask for hours when he does that surgery. And, um, and he does that for a reason, was because he doesn't want germs getting into those, uh, I would assume, uh, or any kind of infection from the surgery. So, um, but that would be my take on that, is to, to please wear a mask. And, but you know, the great thing is we do live in a country where, where you don't have to. And, uh, and I don't think that our citizens, and probably rightly so, would, uh, are, are going to stand for a mandate to wear a mask. But uh, I would really wish you would. I saw a, p a pastor one time that was preaching, and he said, freedom is the ability to make choices, but liberty is the ability to make the right choices. And I hope we would use liberty and make the right choice on, on wearing masks, because a lot of your elderly people are, are dependent on you. A lot of my parents, my dad just had a heart attack in May. He doesn't need to have COVID, and uh, and my mom has uh, heart problems also. So, I guess I'll take a little bit different tack on it. And I appreciate y'all listening to me, but uh, that's kind of the way I look at. You know, we need to be wearing a mask. So, uh, and saying saying that, I'll uh, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Garen and Dr. Jabin because they. Uh, unfortunately have some bad news because our COVID cases, we had 47 new cases today. COVID is as hot in Haywood County today and right now as it has been since uh, this epidemic or pandemic, whatever we call it, has started. So they're here today to give us an update on that and I asked them to come and so if you would, if you guys would go ahead and welcome Garen and welcome, I know you've got a new position and Patrick's probably the luckiest guy in Haywood <laughs> County because he doesn't have to do this anymore. <laughs> Well, thank you for giving me the chance to talk to you uh, tonight, Commissioners. Um, I just kind of want to give an update of where we are now. Um, there has been quite a bit of change recently. Um, <coughs> the numbers are on the rise nationwide, statewide, and locally. As of today, Haywood County is eight, at 874 uh, positive cases that have occurred. The COVID working number is at 237. At our last uh, August 17th um, meeting, <clears throat> the state had gone down to the yellow status. We are back up to orange as of now for community spread. So we're in the accelerated spread. And with the number of cases that we're currently seeing, we're worried that we could even go into the red. Um, last week, Mission Health reported its highest number of hospitalized COVID patients at 54. The COVID working number is the number of people in isolation after testing positive plus the number of people in quarantine after being identified as a close contact of a known positive. Added together, the sum gives us a good picture of the COVID burden in Haywood County on any given day. On our worst day so far, August 11th, our COVID working number was 377. It has dropped as low as 56 in September recently has been moving back up into the upper 180s and 190s and like I said as of today it's at 237. This puts us back to where we were towards the end of July right before things began skyrocketing. In July and August we had a significant outbreak at a nursing home that accounted for a high number of cases. What we're seeing now is based more on community spread. So in the first 13 days of November we had 113 new cases. 
We are not seeing a lot of clusters from businesses or anything like that. Really, we've not seen any in this month. We do have an, an outbreak that is occurring at one of our nursing homes, long-term care facility. But most of these cases that we looked at were travel-related. Uh, there were 17 that were travel-related, 13 that were work-related, nine for, were from parties such as Halloween parties and things like that. Um, we did have eight that were related to church and the funeral service that had occurred. And then 11 of those are cases that were in the long-term care facilities. 25 of those we interviewed were unknown exposures. Um, and we have had another death uh, this month. They've, uh, like I said, um, this morning when we came in, after having 113 in the first 13 days, this, uh, when we got in this morning over the weekend, we had 47 new cases. Now, we can't mandate a sense of personal responsibility. I mean, the cho choosing to wear a mask is up to each individual. And the only way that we are going to knock this down is for people to make those choices. Although we have been monitoring this outbreak at the long-term care facility, we're currently not seeing these clusters. So the spread that we're seeing in Haywood County is largely from ignoring the masking and distancing while interacting with family and friends. Um, most of these interviews, and we've talked to people, it's, they've had friends come in from out, outside the county. I'm not talking about immediate family within their own household. It's uh, friends who've come in to visit and have brought cases with them. This is causing some concern with upcoming holidays and related celebrations, as well as the increasing cold weather that's pushing more people indoors. The cases after the first, for the first few weeks after Thanksgiving will give us an indicator of what we can ex anticipate around Christmas. Um, tomorrow, we will begin to start using our state, COVID, our, our state tracers as contact tracers. We've tried to do all of this in-house up to this point, but the numbers have gotten so large that our public health nurses basically spend all day on the phone doing contact tracing, and we're not able to do the other services and all the, all the other services that we normally would. With that, I'll uh, let uh, Dr. Javen speak. You guys here okay? Yeah. Um, thanks for having us back. Um, let me back up just a second. You can look here where the X is. Uh, those 47 cases are not all included in the state numbers right now. That number was 865, 855 yesterday. Um, and so we've got 47 on top of that. If you look at that X, that's where it's headed. And we've been watching this curve if you go back today, 145 or so, um, slightly accelerates through the expected curve and then has taken off you know, from day 205 or so, taken off now to where you see. If you look at that curve uh, recently up to that X, it looks like the same curve that we saw uh, back in July and August, which is the green line. It's starting to follow that same exponential takeoff. Um, and we don't know where that's going, but um, one thing here is that with this number all of a sudden, yeah, as Garen said, resources to do the contact tracing is, are, are stretched. Um, and it's going to be really important right now for people not to wait on the health department to contact them to decide if they need to quarantine or isolate. It's going to be really important for people to take it upon themselves right now until we can at least get ourselves caught up to make that decision on their own. If you've got symptoms and you get tested, please, Stay isolated until your result comes back. I could give you six stories right now in the last two weeks of where people have not done that, and it's contributed to spread once they all of a sudden find out, oh my gosh, I'm positive. I've been running around work or other gatherings or my family or someone else. Now I'm positive. Now I've got all these other people who've been exposed. So if you get symptoms, please, and you decide that you need to get tested, get tested. But please isolate until your result comes back. And please, if that's the case, please notify those who have been in close contact with you so they can be careful because infections are going to happen. We're going to get groups and clusters of infections. The, the, the challenge is can we nip it in the bud and keep it contained to just that, 
That's how we keep this from getting out of control. So I want, uh, want you to imagine something for um, just a second. Imagine that you are at a remote railroad crossing and you need to get to the other side right now. So remote that there's no signal, no guardrail to warn if a train is coming. To your left, the track rounds a sharp bend and you can't see if a train is coming. You just don't know when or how fast it's moving, but you know it is coming. Do you close your eyes, bolt across and hope for the best? Do you just freeze, unable to move? Or are you careful, listen, try to get a better look, proceed cautiously? Now here's the metaphor. The train is the virus barreling at you. There's no warning signal because you can't tell who around you is pre-symptomatic, contagious, but not yet showing symptoms. You're at a crossroads with a choice to make. This is a tool um, put together by Dr. Ian McKay, sent to me by Dr. Alexander uh, Zayich. And you can plug in the various actions uh, of the precautions that are recommended, and you can see what that does to your risk. So just because we can't be interactive right here, uh, let me go through a couple of those. If you wear a mask and you can't keep distant, then you're re you've reduced your risk 75%. If you can keep your distance, that's a 95% reduction. And let's say you choose not to wear a mask, but others do that for you. They've decreased your risk by 75%. Both people wear a mask in distance, 98% reduction. Add in good hand hygiene, 99.4% reduction. So if you take 10 people, no one practices any precautions around others and all 10 get infected. If instead, each person wears a mask, keeps distance and washes well, essentially none of those 10 get infected. So let's pause for just a moment. There are many legitimate concerns out there in addition to physical health. There's concerns about jobs, the economy, rights, liberties, faith, individualism, and each requires a choice. But the virus is not one of those choices. It's here and it's real, and it affects every choice each of us has to make about our other concerns. And if we favor one over another, yeah, we might benefit, but at what cost? If we don't take care of health, what, what's the cost to our economy? We've seen that. If we favor jobs at any cost, we run a risk to health. If we favor the freedom to make decisions based on how it affects me, it poses a risk to others. So our choices are not one-dimensional. It's natural to focus on a certain set of concerns and dismiss others, but that doesn't make those others less legitimate. And we can look around the country, and now indeed our county, and see that. So take a deep breath. Here's the question. Is it possible that there is a way forward that honors all these concerns that doesn't mean I have to abandon my concern about what I'm afraid is going to happen? And how do we have a respectful conversation about what we in Hayward County want and need to do? To answer this, let's just set aside the science, the data, and the projections for a moment, and let's focus just on what we can see with our own eyes. We can see that as of today, there are 38 of the 50 states now in the red zone for risk. Yesterday, it was 33. A month ago, it was about half that number. North Carolina is next in line, right now at number 39, just barely below the red zone threshold. And for us in Haywood County, if the trend over the past two weeks continues, and what we see over this weekend continues, we may very well be there now. A marked difference from a month ago, when we had one of the lowest, if not the lowest, rate of new cases in North Carolina for a period of time. And remember, what we see today is because of what we were or were not doing two or three weeks ago. In Haywood County, from late August to September, as Garen pointed out, it took us a month to add 100 new cases. From late September to late October, another 100 cases. It's taken us, and then it took two weeks to add the next 100, and now, in one week, we've added another 100. We, we saw, in March and April, when the doubling rate of new cases around the country was below five days, hospitals got overwhelmed. That means not only COVID patients risk not getting the care they need, but no one else either. We can see places like South Dakota and North Dakota, which have positive test rates above 50%. More than half the people being tested are positive. They have rates of cases 10 times what we have here in Haywood County. Exponential growth that is threatening their healthcare systems. 
This weekend, the hospital here had seven people admitted with COVID, five of those in the ICU. That's the most we've seen at any time during this pandemic, and as Garen pointed out, what missions experience has been this week as well. And what will we see for all our family, friends, and neighbors who work in the healthcare system at much higher risk themselves for exhaustion, fatigue, and illness? And what will that mean if you get sick enough to need them? So I hope the obvious conclusion here is what we are now doing about this virus is not working out so well. I'm sure you're familiar with Einstein's insanity trap, you know, doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. If your job or your business was not doing so well, what would you do? I suspect you would learn and adapt, acknowledge the reality, make some changes. This is what we do as people. A week or so ago, I was talking with someone who was shocked to find that a person without any symptoms can be contagious. Their exasperated response to me was, seems like there's nothing we can do. Well, there's a lot we can do. It's right there. And it's not about the virus. We know it's barreling towards us. It's all about you and me. We are the ones standing at the crossroads. And there's no warning signal, no sure way to know if any one of us or you is pre-symptomatic and a risk to those you care about. For those who worry about your liberties and freedom to choose as you see fit, you know, the Declaration of Independence refers to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And I hope we would all be patriotic enough to honor the Declaration. Well, what do you do when your life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness bumps up against the life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness of someone else? Where in our society is it acceptable for my choice to harm you? How do we resolve that fairly? And I'm sure you're aware that at, at the government at the beginning of this country, government was granted a role in protecting public health for just this sort of reason. For those of you who worry about your job, haven't we seen right here in Haywood County businesses that have adapted <clears throat> to continue operating and be safe? And for those who feel their faith is under attack, what about the many houses of worship doing their part to support their congregations in a safe manner? One-dimensional thinking has not served us well. And here's the thing, it doesn't have to be either or. It can be and. It will just look different. It will take adapting, and it will take new thinking and new action to get what we want. So, we're all trying to get through a scary and uncertain time, and I trust that whatever your differing opinions, whatever your choices, each of us is trying our best to muddle through. So let me propose a way that we can all get what we want. I propose that we define success this way. Our aim is to preserve health and safety. And what I mean by that is not just physical health, economic health, emotional health, spiritual health, individuals and families. And so I would ask, can you live with and support that? And if so, the strategy is right there. People are concerned about the need for another widespread lockdown. And what have we seen with lockdowns? They do work if what we need to do is to slow the spread, flatten the curve, and preserve the health care system, but it comes at a big cost. Now, if we were in a place like South Dakota, not to pick on South Dakota, where people have allowed the virus to get totally out of control, there may not be another choice left. It may be the only slice of Swiss cheese left for those folks. And truth is, lockdown is not about the government imposing something on you. It's about how our choices force a last-ditch effort to protect health and safety. Do we need to go there? You know, there's analysis by Goldman Sachs that shows if everyone wore a face covering, it would stem the spread of virus just as well as a renewed lockdown, but without the 5% decrease in the economy a lockdown would cause. And by the way, just for comparison, our country for the previous few years before COVID was growing at 2 to 2.5% 2 GDP. So in essence, we could save two years of economic growth with such an action. That's two years of growth and profit for your business. That's two years for your job. Physical health without the hit to the economy. Can you embrace that? So do we need a lockdown? Well, we've seen how to live more safely right here in Haywood County. Houses of worship, restaurants, driving concerts. These are, there are examples about how these have done really, been done really safely, but only when organized diligently, adapted for safety, and when those in attendance do their part. The crossroads we now face is Thanksgiving. The question is, 
Will this leave us out of control? Or can we all spend Thanksgiving with those we care about in as safe a manner as possible? Maybe it's time we try wearing our hat a little differently, a different uniform, one that thinks beyond one dimension. And we know how. It's right there. So do your own calculation. You can go to the website. It's up there, www.omnicalculator.com. Will this make Thanksgiving look different? Of course it will. There are trade-offs to be made. You know, if everyone quarantined for 14 days before getting together, then we would know for sure no one is pre-symptomatic. But that's not necessarily practical. So maybe we gather together remotely, or we gather together outside, or we honor each other by committing to wear a mask except when sharing our meal. Maybe we eat in the same space, but sitting apart rather than around a table. Maybe we have a hand washing station and we remind each other to use it. Maybe we choose that being together in some fashion is better than not gathering at all. The point is it can be done more safely. This is how. So my question to each of you, do you have it in your heart to act so that those you care about are protected? Do you have it in your mind that right now health is what we all want? Physical, emotional, spiritual, economic, family, a healthy Haywood County, a healthy country, a healthy world. And do you have it in your brain to figure out how to adapt what you need to do to achieve this? We each have choices to make with hard trade-offs. And to be clear, they are your choices to make. But whether the virus is here or not is not a choice. It's here. And I can assure you that at the health department, everyone is working tirelessly toward this goal of health and safety. And I'm not sure what Garen and I will be saying the next time we're invited back to bring an update to everyone. But I can assure you this, what we end up reporting to you is up to what you choose to do. And it starts with Thanksgiving. So thank you for listening and happy to entertain any questions. Anybody have any questions for Dr. Jabin or Garen? Uh, I'd like to know <clears throat> what the cases that you're seeing now, the cases changing some. I mean, you, you know, you, we receive, we're seeing more cases, but obviously we only have seven at the hospital. And, um, and obviously the, the, what it does is affect people who, um, I mean, it, it affects people who have symptoms already that have issues. That, that's mainly who it affects. So, and I know they're, they're learning to treat it better. So, I mean, I just kind of want to know what the status of these cases, what are people showing? I mean, how, they're obviously going back home because they're not going to the hospital. So I mean, what are you seeing the symptoms now? The symptoms are the same. Right? So the main symptoms of fever, cough, aches, etc. Um, we also see some dizziness and headache. And a lot of people right now are having sinus-like symptoms that they just think are sinus-like symptoms and turn out to be positive for COVID. It's one of the things that makes this really difficult. There are no, you can say this is X and this is Y. It can be across a whole gamut of things. Um, I think the one thing that we are seeing a little bit different, Kirk, um, about Two weeks ago, we looked at the previous 60 days of people who were considered close contacts, so they're in contact tracing, uh, and how many of the, so they were exposed to somebody who was positive, but they themselves were not symptomatic. How many of, what percentage of those people actually turned positive? And out of 360 something people, it was like 8%. These are people with close contact, only 8% really converted to be positive. I think that's changing now. We're seeing a lot more situations where entire families are getting infected. Gatherings of people, um, rather than just maybe one or two or three getting infected, now 10 or 12 or 13 or 14 are getting infected. So I, I don't know how to account for that. We're just sort of starting to, that is becoming clearer over the last few weeks, but no doubt that's contributing to what we're seeing with the numbers. Well, how are they treating it now? How are, are they they how are doctors treating this? If you get COVID, if, you're, if you get tested for for the virus, and they say you've got the virus, so what do so they the, give you? Yeah, well, first thing is, if your symptoms are mild to moderate, you should be isolating, and most people are able to recover at home. What we've seen from the beginning of this pandemic is somewhere around day five to seven, the people who are gonna deteriorate, that's when they really deteriorate, and they usually deteriorate with respiratory symptoms. That's when they end up in the hospital. Um, there are people who are, uh, there are people who are getting other symptoms, neurologic symptoms and other things. When the person goes in the hospital, if it's a primary respiratory thing, oxygen is the initial treatment, uh, and it depends where they evolve to. Sometimes they need assisted treatment. Um, 
We try not to put people in ventilators as much as before. We found that, that even those people have really, really low oxygen rates, oxygen rates that sometimes would be alarming, like you look at them and go, how could you possibly be alive? They tend to, some, to do pretty well. So the real advances in treatment have come with how we manage oxygen, how we manage ventilators, um, putting people prone on their stomach, uh, if it gets to that, has been a real help in terms of being able to ventilate people. The treatments that are out there, um, if you look at remdesivir, for instance, um, it's, not, it, it's being used, very marginal benefit. If you look at, and, and if you look at steroids in the sickest people, there have been, again, some but marginal treatment. Um, recently, I think out today, uh, I did a, a thing about monoclonal antibody treatment, which of course the president got. Very early on, it's hard to know if this stuff really works or not. We'll learn more as time goes by. Vaccine development, you may have seen today, Moderna is the second company that says they've had a preliminary look at their data and feel very confident about the effectiveness of that. I gotta tell you, all this data is really early. Um, and I think there's going to be a real tension between wanting to get something out and the scientists wanting to make sure they do this safely. Um, right now, there are guardrails in place for review by independent panels um, and for the rest of the data to come out. Even if we get a vaccine approved next week for emergency youth au use authorization, the challenge is the manufacturing and the distribution. So you're not going to see, you're, you're going to see it going to high risk groups first, which is going to be primarily long term care facility, health worker staff. Uh, there's also talk about people with multiple um, comorbidities. But the fact of the matter is, there's no one vaccine that's going to be able to be produced in enough numbers to serve everyone. So we're hoping that there will be several different kinds of vaccines that, that will show to be effective and safe, obviously. So what this means for the rest of us is that at the very earliest, it's going to be late spring to summer before that becomes available. And the reason that Dr. Fauci says even once the vaccine becomes available, we're still going to need to social distance, wear a mask, and pay attention to this stuff is because if we start vaccinating today, it's going to take a while to get enough people vaccinated to where there is protection in the community. So if you listen to the epidemiologist, um, really I think we're looking at probably 2022 before we really start to see things loosen up. We've got another period of time to get everything in place so we can be protected. This is difficult. Nobody likes having to do all this sort of stuff, but what's the alternative? The alternative is 38 out of 50 states in the red, and we're right behind them. So um, that's the landscape as I see it. Is that true? I, guess, I guess what I'm mainly getting to the issue is that, that I see that folks that get diagnosed with the virus, they get diagnosed an overwhelming majority of them, 90-something percent, are just sent home to quarantine and they're not provided anything, and, and you're telling me that there's nothing they can give those people right now if you've got coronavirus, even if they send you home, because they send most people home. Yeah. I mean, everybody they right. send home unless you've got some, you know, respiratory issues, if, you're, if you have diabetes, if you're overweight or something like that. So it, I guess it's concerning to me that after, since March of this past year and all the way till now, we don't have some kind of minor treatment. I'm not saying a vaccine, but right. to, get, to, give the, to give the regular person, the 90-something percent that get it, we just say, you know, you go to the hospital, okay, you got it, so you go back home. Yeah. And that's what they do. Yeah. And, and, and so I just I don't, yeah, I, yeah. I don't understand that. And, well, and the other thing is yeah. what I wanted to ask you was about the, the deaths that we have. When... When we have a death, and, it, and one of the causes of that is, is COVID, is no matter the condition of the person at the time of their death or age, if they have the coronavirus when they die, are they listed as a COVID death? So this gets into how death certificates are done. Um, I did a video on that. I'll be happy to send it to you. But here's the down and dirty. Death certificates are, have a primary cause of death, and then there's like four lines of, of, of contributory things. And then I there's below that whole section. all the time. I get them. I do okay. states and I see the right. death certificates. So just everybody understands. And then there's a whole section below of other comorbidities. That primary cause of death may be something like heart attack, right? But then there may be contributors to that. Would that person have had the heart attack if they didn't have COVID? If that's not the case, COVID would be listed as a contributory thing. What I can tell you about death certificates is many of them have respiratory failure or something like that or pneumonia. 
Um, but they would not have had that without COVID being a significant contributor, if not the contributor to what's going on. So what you can say is looking at death certificates, they are not underrepresenting COVID as a contributory cause of death. So if it's, if it's, if COVID is listed as the fourth, and I'm just doing this for my own sure, education because yeah. I want to know, if COVID is listed as the fourth cause of, or reason for death, then it's still categorized as a COVID death. That's correct. And also be careful that if, if it's listed as fourth, that doesn't mean it's fourth in priority. That I just agree. means that's where it got written on the page. Okay. Essentially, all five of those things were contributed to the, to the death. Your question about, about treatment, it, it, yes. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, you know, the statistics have been from the beginning, 80% of people who get infected recover without any specific treatment needed. Now, hopefully we, don't, we hope they don't spread that to anybody else. 20% of the people get hospitalized. 5% of those people are ICU type patients. The death rate has gone down because we've been better at managing ventilators and oxygen and those sorts of things. Perhaps steroids help marginally. Perhaps remdesivir helps marginally. Monoclonal antibody treatment has been shown to, to be worse for people hospitalized. So that's going to be a treatment aimed at people in the outpatient world when it becomes available. The problem with monoclonal antibodies is it's, it's super complex to manufacture. It's really expensive. And right now, uh, the company that just got emergency use authorization says they'll have enough to treat a million people by the end of the year. Well, we had a million new cases in the country in the last two weeks. So you can see there's going to be a real difficulty in terms of getting that to people who may benefit from it. But you're right, Kirk. They're, they're, we have not really hit on the thing. Um, but to be honest, that's how it is in medicine. O oftentimes, it's we figure out a little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit there, and then over time, it coalesces into something big. We've only been at this eight months, so. And, and don't get me wrong. Yeah. But by asking these questions, I, I just want to know and sure. understand. I, I don't disagree with the mass situation. I don't disagree that that, that prevents that. I know I've touch base with people that I have known a long time in the, in the medical field that I respect very much. Not, I'm, I'm not saying I disrespect you at all. But, I mean, it is clear that the mask helped prevent the spread of this disease. I mean, it, it, it's obvious. And anybody who says different, I, I don't agree with that. But I also think that the numbers are skewed some. And, and obviously we know this is a fun, not, not you yeah, financially yeah. benefiting yeah. from this, but there's people that are financially benefiting from this all over the place and, and want to have this vaccine and want to produce this vaccine. So I, I, I guess, you know, it's getting back to the comments that, that were made earlier and, you know, the, the presentations. I, COVID is a serious thing. I think it's more serious than the flu. Um, do I think it's been exaggerated some? I, th I do. I think it's been exaggerated. The numbers have. Um, and I think that's what's caused mis so much mistrust and so many questions is because, because of that. And uh, I don't have an answer to it. I just, I just have my opinion as, sure. as to well, how well, things are going. I'll give you an answer to that. Um, let's say it's been exaggerated 25%. That's still 200,000 people dead in this country. Flu has never killed 200,000 people in this country except for 1918. So even if it is exaggerated, does it really change the way that we should be thinking about it? No, I, yeah. I think we should. I'm not, I'm not yeah. disagreeing that oh, no, we no. should take it seriously. Yeah. I think we should take it seriously. Yeah. I, I just wish that that was explained more like you've answered my questions than, yeah. than when, what normal people get when they look at social media and the news. Yeah. That's all. You know, I agree. I wish that we had, would have been clear about masks early on and the reason that masks were discouraged early on. I think that that wasn't shared well. Um, I think that there's lots that we've learned along the way. Um, I think that the real challenge, the difficult for us, and I say us in terms of the community, in terms of the f fatigue of this, is that we hear different things as time rolls on. Well, that's science. That's how medicine works. And we have to be able to adapt to that. And when we get stuck on what we heard in April and we can't get past that, it becomes a real obstacle to moving forward. Um, and so that has been one of the challenges for sure. I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you on that. Thank you. I guess I'm like Kirk. Uh, some of the comments he made, you know, I I think the the problem or uh, what a lot of people struggle with is the percentages that you're given. You know, most people that get sick are sent home to to self isolate, quarantine, so they can get better. Uh, I don't know the exact numbers, but I know that 99% something other. You correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, do recover 
so I guess I think that's where the confusion is with a lot of folks. They say, why, why shut everything down? Why, why, why lock things down uh, when, when you've got such a small percentage? I, and don't get me wrong, I'm like Kurt. My grandmother passed away from COVID, so, so I do respect it. Uh, I have a very good friend of mine that just lost both his parents. And so uh, it does concern me, uh, but I, I feel like it, if we do practice the three W's, uh, that that that's what we need to do. So I, I don't know what you can say to that to, to help people realize their concerns of uh, why was such a small percentage uh, of deaths and and the the high recovery rate why we would lock everything down, self quarantine, and shut stuff down. So you know, I, I think that part of this is the um, we get faked out by percentages. So let's look at the percentage, but let's also look at the absolute number. I think you really have to look at both to get a handle on the impact. Um, thank goodness the death rate is as low as it is. Can you imagine if this was like, you know, um, MERS or some of the other, the other ones that have much higher mortality rate? The other part of this, I think, is yes, it's easy for me to get a mild infection. I get over it. What's the big deal? The problem with this virus is that a person can be contagious without even knowing they're sick, and it's the person they give it to. You may recall uh, last time when Patrick and I were here, he had a graph of six or seven people who spread from one to the other. Number six had no idea who number one was. This is what the real, the real danger, the real challenge with this virus is, because we can't look at it and see it and know that it's, that it's not, you know, where it is. And that's why we all have to be vigilant all the time. That's why I wear a mask. I wear a mask, yeah, it protects me some, but I wear it because I respect you and I don't want to get you sick. It's just like what Kevin, just like what Kevin was saying. So there, this has drawn a real tension in our country because we have a society that's very focused on individualism. And now we're being tasked with having to challenge the other side of individualism, which is collectivism. It's the group, what's good for the group? How do I, how do I impact that? You only have to look at countries around, this world, around the world that have been able to tamp this thing down, like a country like Vietnam, which I think has had like 10 deaths, right? Those are countries that are different in terms of how they balance the individual versus the group. And I've, I've said this before, but this is one of those times where I think we as a society need to sort of pause and say, I don't have to give up my individual interests, boy, but maybe I need to sort of balance this a little bit different way right now. We'll get past COVID, we'll get past this pandemic, We'll get past it a whole lot easier and with a whole lot less uh, suffering and death if we can just tilt our hat a little bit differently, think about a little bit differently, um, consider a little bit differently. People have mentioned the Ten Commandments up there. What does it say? Let's take that to heart. So I, I think, Brandon, that's, that's, don't get hung up solely on the percentages of things. We have to look at the absolute value of the number. And I think we have to honor the risk each of us can be towards someone else. And if we respect them and our family, our friends, our neighbors, then, then we should be willing to take that extra step to, to do that. That's what I would hope. Well, no, no doubt I don't claim to be the smartest guy in the room, but I am a, a numbers guy, I, just a businessman. That's part of me. So sure. uh, that's why I look at that. You know, if, if we've not given, in, given them uh, some kind of medication or doing something for them, just sending them home. I, I can understand, I guess, what I'm saying, why the people have concerns of uh, shutting everything down. Again, uh, if you want to wear a mask, I think that's great. I even wore one in myself today. So, uh, And I wear it when I'm around my mom or around an elderly person or someone that's got a compromised immune system. So I respect them. Uh, but again, I don't think that it's something that needs to be mandated. But I do have another question uh, uh, as well. I don't know if you can answer this or not, and I hate to put you guys on the spot, but do you know, I know at one time we were keeping up with the ages, what age group had COVID. Yeah. I know with our numbers, uh, where they're at today, do you, can you give us a feel on who has it? Yeah. The, actually, the percentages are pretty much the same all along. Um, the, the biggest age range is sort of 20 to 50 the biggest number of cases, 20 to 50. Um, there's generally a pretty equal number of cases, you know, below 20 and above 70. So it's really, that has not actually changed for us in Haywood County so much. It got skewed a little bit with the Silver Bluff stuff, but now that that's, there have been more cases, it's sort of gotten settled out. And I think that's pretty consistent across, across the state. 
um, the state as well. I know we just had another uh, nursing home facility. Uh, is that part of this as well, the numbers that we're showing today? Yes. Uh, we, with that facility, I think we were up to 11 between uh, a couple of faculty and mostly residents. So that's where we're at now. Yeah. Hold okay. On. All right. Thank you. Stephanie, we Stephanie, I know, I know, I know y'all are. I know Stephanie, you're new, but we don't go back and forth. So if, no, no, but yeah, but you you can't speak from the audience. You know, if you get your three minutes, yeah, I'm, and, sorry. I'm happy. Well, you know, we, you know, I I'm happy. I'm happy to sit down with you guys and talk about stuff anytime you want. I'd be happy to do it publicly sometime. So, Brandon, I think, you know, you mentioned about uh, lockdowns and mandates and stuff. And, you know, I think it's pretty clear we don't have to do that. We have a path forward without having to do that. And it's pretty, it's pretty clear. Yeah. I'm sorry, but you, you asked something else. Um, do what I'm you asked something about. else, and I don't know that I No, I think you answered uh, okay. the questions that I had. Uh, I did have one other, but I, I lost track. I'll let Commissioner <laughs> Long go if he's got any questions. No, I just appreciate you guys coming, and I, you know, I think I said back early on that the data worldwide showed that this was a, our generation's polio. It, it attacks elderly people more so than, than younger people. It kills them. And uh, so any focus that y'all can do on our elderly care centers, and I know you are doing that. Uh, I live very close to Silver Bluff. We lost 30 people in a very short period of time. So I know it's real. I've, I've been taking care of elderly parents. Where I work, I have to wear a mask. It's a condition of employment. I've gotten used to it. If I can't breathe good, uh, if I'm in a very uh, respiratory uh, duress place where I'm climbing a ladder or something, I'll take it off. It's common sense. But I was talking to the center and I was talking to the deputy coming in you know, we've gotten such a place in society where we can't let the family, the family unit, <laughs> I guess it's deteriorated so bad that we haven't had the government tell us how to act. You know, when I grew up, my mother warmed my hind end up if I coughed in somebody's <laughs> face or sneezed in somebody's face. It's been disrespectful. And I wasn't raised that way. I always have these outbursts sometimes where we have an uncontrollable cough or sneeze and but, you know, going back to your raising, you know, I was told, hey, don't blow your nose in public. Go to the bathroom. I was trained that way. If you, if you feel a big cough coming on, get outside or go somewhere out <clears throat> and don't cough in somebody's face. You know, some of these common sense things that, that I hope I've transferred that to my kids, but uh, in a lot of these things are common sense, you know, uh, and I, I know you, you've you communicated to us that some people, you know, don't have any symptoms and spread it, and that's, that's, that's bad, so I don't like to, I don't like somebody coughing my face or somebody sneezing my face, I, I don't like that, <laughs> so, and I don't, I don't want to do that to somebody, I wouldn't do it on purpose, but, but I do wear a mask, I, I take care of now elderly mother, and, uh, I do, I do wear it. Uh, I believe they work. But I'm not going to beat somebody over the head and make them wear it. Uh, educate yourself and do the right thing. Yeah, you know, I mean, we each have a choice to make about what we can do. You can't enforce this sort of stuff. Everybody has a different angle of what's concerning them. Um, you know, these folks have things that are real concerns. They're legitimate concerns. Uh, the question is, how do we meld all these concerns and move forward to get through this as easily as we can? And I think that's, that's the real challenge for us. 
Let's understand each other's position. Let's understand what the science is. Let's understand what we have seen and what we know, what we have experienced. And let's put this together, agree that we can disagree, but also agree that we can move forward together. I've got one other question. I had a guy I went to high school with that he has several comorbidity factors, terrible. I heard he had this stuff. I thought, man, it's, it's not going to turn out good. So I called him the other day, and he was, he was telling me he's at home. He got out of the hospital, and he was on nebulizer treatments. Is that the steroid treatment you were referring to earlier, a steroid by nebulizer? Hey, Tommy, can you hold that question? We need to take a break just for about 10 minutes. Okay. Hang on just a second. So we're going to take about a 10-minute break. Sorry. <laughs> we'll resume here in about...
meeting. Uh, let's see, Tommy, you were asking a question, I know, and I, cut, I interrupted you. you. If you can remember what it was. Oh, I, I was wondering if they were doing the steroid treatment with a nebulizer on adults like they do children. Probably not. That's probably uh, albuterol or, or used for wheezing, asthma kinds of things. They don't, they're not generally given, the steroids are being given intravenously, not, okay. not nebulized. Okay, uh, Garen, I was wondering, are you all able to keep up with all the new cases with contact tracing? Has that really hampered you? Uh, uh, yes, that, that's why we'll be starting tomorrow. We'll be going with the state uh, contact tracers. It's uh, the numbers. Each nurse throughout the day, eight hours, they could probably get through about six to seven cases with all the calls that have to be made. So, uh, how, how many cases? Six, six, seven or eight a day for okay. each individual nurse. So, okay. once you get into the numbers we're seeing now, we're going to have to. Uh, Are, have you got enough? So, uh, I guess I'm wondering to make sure you have enough staff. I mean, well, we like today we pulled in uh, staff from environmental health and staff from DSS to help with okay. these just to kind of get through and we'll be working through what occurred this weekend for the next couple of days okay and there is a lag between the cases we see and before you'll see it reported on the state website so there will it's not like this number will just suddenly jump on the state website there is a little bit of a lag there okay well, i think that, i think well i appreciate all the work you're doing on that because I, I would want to know if somebody if i'd been exposed you know and stuff so does anybody else have any questions? Uh, I do. I got one Go more, ahead. Go ahead. if you don't mind. Uh, do we have anywhere posted? Is it on the website or somewhere where we have the actual COVID cases? I was asked during the break uh, about that. So, do we have that posted anywhere? It's, it's it, there's a state it site. We. We usually we were keeping it up on the county's website. That's what I thought. Uh, I thought it was on the county's, but I wanted mm -hmm, to make sure so they can go to our county website. Is it, is yeah. it on the top? It's very the, top. Okay, but it is the actual cases that, that we have. Yeah, actual, we take it directly cases. from the state and put it there. So, like I said, there's a little bit of a lag. Well, I was we'll going to see say, more. Yeah, they need to understand there, there is a lag. That, there is, yes. Right. Okay. What, what do you think the lag is? A day or two? Well, you, you got to look at where the cases are coming from. They're coming from different sources like the oh, hospitals. Okay. And, and so when all that comes in, we'll see it. But it may not be reported to the state by those those places that are sending us the cases immediately. They may sit, Some of the cases we saw today, we probably should have seen some of these coming in towards the end of last week, Thursday and Friday. Oh, okay. But it um, just held out because... Maybe the hospital didn't release everything they had to us at that time, and it was things like that. Okay. Anybody have any other questions for staff? Okay. No. It's okay. okay. I appreciate y'all coming, and uh, I'm, I mean, if y'all have some questions, you can you can corner these guys in the back. I'm sure they'll be more than happy to answer your question. We had we had a fellow back here who had a question. So Do we need to send the sheriff's department back there. <laughs> They're back there. They're back there. <laughs> okay. Be nice. Hey, look, friend. Okay. Okay. We'll move on. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. We'll move on to uh, administrative agency for reports and presentations, and uh, our next our first uh, item under that is the the Valia Health Physical Monitoring Report for the quarter ending. September 30, 2020. We have our finance director, Julie Davis, this evening to talk about that. Good evening. Hi, you, Julie. You have a, a letter in your packet from Via Health, and it includes a fiscal monitoring report that looks like this. If you want to flip to that, I'm just going to very quickly hit some of the high spots of this. The uh, this report is their quarterly report through September 30th, 2020. The, um, the total revenues, and it's, it's going to be in column four, where they have the total revenues through September 30th, $115,181,500. Down a little bit farther on the page, still in column four. The uh, total expenditures through September, $104,397,359. Uh, 
for a total net income of $10,784,140 through September 30th. And there's a lot more information here that they explain some of these numbers for you to read uh, when you have a chance. Anybody have any questions for Julie on that? That's a lot of money. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Julie. Okay, our next uh, report will be the WNC Regional DWI Task Force update, Alan Pitt. Alan, I appreciate you sticking with us tonight. Welcome. I'm going to leave with this lady over here in the invitation. Separate from what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, talking to the mic, too, Ellen, if you would. Right there. Glad to get this off. Um, good evening, and thank you for your indulgence. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. um, my name is Ellen Pitt, for anybody that doesn't know me. I'm the second most senior crime victim advocate and court monitor in the state for Mothers Against Drunk Driving, North Carolina, and one of the most senior members of the Western North Carolina Regional DWI Task Force. I'm not paid, hired, or elected. As many of you know, the primary purpose of our task force, or one of the primary purposes, is to prevent DWI child endangerment. But I'm gonna to talk to you about something different tonight. As the homeless and high risk for crime population in Haywood County continues to escalate and continues to cause controversy, um, I believe that you as elected officials need to examine all of your approaches and consider becoming advocates for an inexpensive, life-saving endeavor as opposed to endeavors that may enable or have little impact and drain funds from other community needs. At some point, some of you may have heard of specialty courts, often referred to as treatment courts, sobriety courts, drug courts, or veterans courts. Nearby judicial districts, including multi-county districts, have successfully established them with very little funding. In 2014, I was asked by the director of the North Carolina Governor's Highway Safety Program to review the newly established Buncombe County DWI Treatment Court. I've been an ambassador for that court and for sobriety courts in general ever since that time for about six years. I was educated about the court early on and have attended many sessions and completion ceremonies over the years. I've been allowed to have DWI crime victims observe the court and the coordinator of the court is a very important member of our task force. I also frequently vi visit veterans court. I've reviewed district and superior courts in all Western North Carolina counties and East Tennessee for 18 years. Sometimes in my role as a crime victim advocate, sometimes as a court monitor and commentator, my opinion of specialty courts is therefore not uninformed. These courts are the extreme opposite of enabling. They're the most severe courts that I review. The consequences for stepping out of line are immediate and harsh. By the same token, the reward for compliance is a completely restored, sober life with healed families, paid debts, and the joy of facing those around you with pride. These are courts of compassion, honesty, and accountability. The defendant must plead guilty to his or her charges, do a prescribed percentage of active jail time, abide by strict curfews, be randomly drug tested, Sometimes wear a continuous alcohol monitoring leg bracelet for 120 day minimum. They're intensely supervised by the court for 16 to 24 months. Non-compliance is not an option. In the nearby 35th prosecutorial district, which includes the five counties of Madison, Yancey, Mitchell, Avery, and Watauga, a specialized court was established several years ago. It's supported by a small amount of grant funding and a magnificent judge who volunteers his time, as do all Buncombe County judges. Nothing in these courts comes free. Participants must work, must complete classes, often GED classes, must attend mandatory treatment, must pay all outstanding child support and court fines, 
and must follow every instruction of the court, including no contact with prior associates who could cause them not to succeed. They appear in front of the same judge and the same prosecutor every 14 days, and a full report is presented to the judge. They are not allowed to be late or absent. A time is coming, hopefully in the very near future, when you will be asked to endorse or support these courts, and that support is not necessarily financial. I'm making a request to you now that you first learn about these courts. Several years ago, we arranged for Judge Julie Keppel and her staff to come to Winesville Police Department and present the facts, the strategies, and the success rate of her court. Although we had the Macon County Clerk of Court, police officers, probation officers, and elected officials from other counties, only one of our commissioners came. That was you, Mr. Inslee. I don't know if you remember that or not. No legislation is sought or required, as you see by the already established courts across the state. In most of these courts, there is only one paid position that of the court coordinator. The coordinator of the Buncombe County Veterans Court worked for the first six months with no salary and then became grant funded. The coordinator of the Buncombe County DWI Treatment Court was initially 100% funded by the North Carolina Governor's Highway Safety Program. These courts are not meant to create jobs for friends or colleagues. All positions are already employed by the courts, Department of Public Safety, or treatment providers, and the time they give to specialty courts is either volunteered or incorporated into already existing schedules. We all know by now that enabling is not the answer. It would be the same if you were a diabetic making bad, confused, irrational decisions because your blood sugar was affecting your brain and we gave you clean spoons every day and a big bag of sugar and did not require you to change your diet, exercise, or do the work that saves your life. In sobriety courts, you are responsible for your actions. Enabling is not mercy, nor is it justice. In closing, I ask that when the district attorney or some yet unidentified visionary judge ask for your help in this life-saving endeavor, that you be informed and prepared, prepared to help educate the public and your colleagues in other counties by seeking all the information that you can. Julian Davis and Kevin Rumsley, who are coordinators of the Buncombe County DWI Treatment Court and Buncombe County Veterans Court, are waiting to meet with you as a group or individually. It's your duty to explore the possibility of specialty courts for the safety of your constituents. And perhaps your knowledge and understanding will inspire the legal community. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Do I have any questions for Ellen? I, I remember the, uh, I remember when we went, you had that, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and, and the one thing I came away with, you know, it seems to me that if you, if alcohol is, you know, as rampant as it is and people need help on trying to get off of it, that the state ought to look at doing some kind of a, a small tax on that substance to be able to fund some of these programs because it would help people get off of them, you know. And uh, I don't know why they don't, but, uh, but, but you know, it's proven that, that these programs work and that they can, uh, you know, really help. And that would help the families and everybody else, you know, if we could do that, so. Yes. Uh, you now can attend a veterans court session or a DWI treatment court session online. They're open um, sometimes to the public. You can go over there, meet with the coordinators, or they'll come over here and present to you. They'll be happy to do that. Um, but uh, you would never think I'd support that kind of endeavor, but I'm their biggest fan. Um, and like I said, I've, I've been reviewing that court now since 2014. So um, I invite you to please learn all you can about it because it's the future of how we have to handle mm -hmm. uh, substance use disorders. Exactly. So thank you. And I've left an invitation with you with this lady over here 
uh, December 5th at 4.30 at the historic Henderson County Courthouse. We'll be doing our, I think, 17th annual candle lighting service. Uh, and it's outdoors, dress for the weather, and do your social distancing and your mask if you need to. Uh, so she has the invitation over here. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen. Okay, we'll move on to our uh, discussion adjustment to the agenda. I don't have anything. Does any other commissioner have anything? Okay, we'll move on to our consent agenda. Uh, Y'all have had the chance to review those six items. Does anybody have any questions about the consent agenda? At all. Okay, hearing and I'll entertain a motion that we approve the consent agenda. So moved. Second. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Okay, that's unanimous. Okay, we'll move on to our regular agenda. Our first item is to request approval of the animal services fee, updated fee schedule. We have our animal services director, Howard Martin, here tonight. That's under attachment nine. Welcome, Howard. Appreciate you hanging in here with us. Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening. Uh, before you today, I have a request for uh, consideration of approval of an updated animal fee schedule. Um, currently, the last uh, updated schedule was back in February of 2000. 18 I've had an increase in uh, fees for uh, spay neuter over at Asheville ASPCA and that uh, is for the adjustment of the fees be glad to answer any questions from what I have for you now have any questions on that I'm just uh, when I looked over this I'm just figuring you're just catching up with the times getting getting up to par on everything yes sir yeah. what did you look at Howard to, to come up with these numbers did you compare it to other counties or can you tell me how you these numbers were in place they needed that we just wanted to put them in front of the board and make sure they were approved okay gotcha yes sir we have extremely low adoption fees now yeah I seen that earlier I didn't realize they were that low but is that a good thing or is that a, well it, it, I mean, I'm sure it helps with adoptions yes. but it, it makes it available to do um, but not give it away uh, and put a three-tier schedule as you see in there to adjust with the needs that we have to facilitate moving the animals out of there more if we get stagnant mm -hmm. make it more available Anybody have any questions? No. I move to approve. Okay, is there a second? Second. Any other discussion? All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Okay, that's unanimous. Thank, Thank you. you, Howard. Appreciate it. Okay, our next item uh, is number two under the regular agenda is to request <coughs> approval of the purchase of 14 vehicles for various departments in the amount of $384,574.60 to be paid by the three hundred fifty-six thousand nine hundred twenty-six dollars and sixty cents from fiscal year 2021 budgeted funds, and twenty-seven thousand six hundred fifty-two dollars from the Pisgah Health Foundation grant funds, and approval for county manager to sign all required required documentation for said purchase. Chris, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Appreciate Chairman. Appreciate you board. sticking with us. <clears throat> um, not to restate everything you just said, I'd, I'd like to give a couple of explanations. <clears throat> we got a, a formal bid for all of these vehicles. Um, the, there were nine chargers, one cargo van, and one Durango that were cheaper to buy from the North Carolina Sheriff's Association than any of the bids we got. So we'd like to purchase those 11 under the exemption for group purchasing program under the general statute. The others we would like to purchase locally, the Ford F-150 from Taylor Motor Company, the two Ford Explorers from Ken Wilson Ford. The, the formal bids were sent out to nine organizations by email, posted on our website. We received three bids back, plus an additional packet of information from a company named Elderton Dodge who cannot formally bid because they own the state contract and they own the exemption 
to group purchasing program in the North Carolina Sheriff's Association. Anybody have any questions for Chris? Okay, I'll entertain a motion. We approve number two of the regular agenda. So moved. A second. Second. Okay, you, any discussion? Is this number two? Okay, I see now. I'm sorry. Number two of the regular agenda. Okay. Any, any questions? Okay. Here now, uh, all in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Okay, is anyone opposed? Okay, you're unanimous. Okay, the third item of the regular agenda is to request approval of revisions to the Haywood County Public Library Board of Trustees bylaws. Haywood County Public Library Collection Department <coughs> Development Policy and Haywood County Public Library Circulation Policy. And we have our library director, Kathy Bossler, here tonight. Welcome, Kathy. Good evening. Thank you for staying, sticking with us. Sure. <laughs> I'm seeking approval of revisions to the Library Board of Trustees bylaws, the library's circulation policy, and approval of a new collection development policy. The bylaws and policies were approved by the Library Board of Trustees at the October meeting and have been reviewed by Frank Queen. Would you like me to go into any specifics? It, it, whatever, what, do you, what do you think, Kirk? No, we, we discussed these thoroughly at the Library Board meeting. I don't see any, I, I didn't see anything that would be um, an issue or controversial and the changes we make just trying to clear them up and if Frank okayed it then my goodness why, why do we need to ask anything further? <laughs> okay. That's why we want to look at it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did notice uh, where it said each board member appointed by the Board of Commissioners shall serve a term of three years not to exceed two consecutive terms without a break in service. Mm -hmm. And we usually have that but occasionally if we have someone that we really need to s stick on there sometimes we do that. I think that's just something we do, right, Tracy? That right, right, yeah. So just just FYI, if, if that ever happens, you know, okay, for somebody you really need to serve again mm -hmm. for whatever reason. So okay, okay. So any other comments or questions for Kathy? Here and then I'll entertain a motion. We approve item three of the regular agenda. So, so move. Second. Third. All in favor, any copy saying aye. 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 Okay, that's unanimous. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. <laughs> okay, your next uh, order of business is number four is to request approval of amendment to the Smoky Mountain Event Center <laughs> Incorporated Bylaws and our attorney, uh, Frank Queen, will <clears throat> talk about that. That's attachment 12. This board appoints all the members of the board of the uh, event center. The change in the bylaws allows uh, those board members to serve staggered terms instead of all of them being replaced at the same time. Staggered board membership is a benefit to nonprofit organizations by providing a continuity of experience by board members. And, uh, and since you all appoint those board members, you need to make that change in the bylaws. They've requested that and, and, uh, at their own board level. Okay. I know we. Uh, when we started the board in 2010, we were having trouble getting enough members. Once we got enough members, we uh, have had to keep them because sometimes we don't get enough people to apply. So, uh, and you probably see it, Tommy, that they're not staggered. And yeah, we, we discussed this at our board meeting, and we, we got in a situation where we could lose <clears throat> practically everybody at the same time. So. Yeah. We need to get that stagger back, as Frank said, to keep the continuity on that board okay. and experience there. So, so it sounds like you've got a plan. So. That was just one little sentence there that, that we put in the bylaws to enable us to do that. So. Okay. Any other comments or questions on that? I expect that after, after what's going on recently, they'll have an overflow of applications <laughs> to serve on that board. We actually do. <laughs> <laughs> they do? Yeah, we actually do. That's good, yeah. then. Okay. 
pick the right You five. did tell them how hard work that was because oh, that yeah. board is, is a hard working board. Yes, if it you is. want it to be successful, you're going to have to work really hard. So, okay, I'll entertain a motion. We approve item four. So moved. Second. Okay, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Okay. Okay, number five of the regular agenda is to request approval of a resolution to dissolve the Haywood County Affordable Housing Council and our attorney, Frank Queen. Go ahead, Frank. That's under attachment 13. Three years ago, the, this board created the advisory council, and after the publication of the Haywood County Affordable Housing Strategy, which was done about the same time, the housing strategy called for the creation of this advisory council. What's become uh, apparent is that the proliferation of, of uh, organizations that are addressing the issue of affordable housing in the community, and more, and more importantly, the, uh, the Waynesville Housing Authority, of course, was always there, but they're uh, expanding. The Smoky Mountain Housing Consortium is a seven-county program all across western North Carolina. That's really adding a lot of horsepower to the, um, to the grant-making and the grant-seeking ability of these organizations. The uh, same thing goes for the uh, Southwestern NC Home Consortium. The, the consensus of the board in that organization was that the advisory council had succeeded in drawing attention and resources to this subject and no longer was needed uh, uh, as a separate entity. The functions that it has of, of advocating for affordable housing are being taken up and, and, and somewhat successfully they haven't gotten the, the giant dollars that they need for, to meet the need, but they have the structures in place to, to seek that uh, assistance and, and the advisory council is no longer needed. And I've been serving on that board and uh, we haven't really met since uh, COVID started, I don't think so. But uh, like you said, Frank, we've got several organizations that have started taking the lead and, uh, and I appreciate everyone that served on that board. I know we spent a lot of time and uh, we, we basically, a lot of things that we discussed, we, you basically see how hard it is to, to get affordable housing in the county. So, uh, but we, we met uh, probably once a month for those years. So uh, I do appreciate the groups that have stepped forward and, and uh, trying to tackle this. So I'll entertain a motion to, uh, to dissolve the Haywood County Affordable Housing Council, which is item five of the regular agenda. Let me make that motion. It, I'm, I just want to ask you, are you in support of doing this? Mm -hmm. this? I mean, it's on the agenda and you're the chairman. I'm assuming you are, so. Yeah. And you've yeah. been on it and seen what's. Yeah, I guess I've got some of the same concerns. I mean, yeah. I, I guess I see these other groups that's working on housing, but it bothers me a little bit that we don't have anybody focused on Haywood County. I know we do Waynesville, but I also heard Frank say there was some trouble getting the funding as well. So I guess we're leaning on you to answer those oh, questions okay. if you feel well, like Well, there's uh, a Smoky Mountain Housing uh, <clears throat> uh, Coalition or Council, that Mountain Projects, Patsy started that one. Right. So that one's kind of covering the whole county. Sure. Waynesville Housing Authority has stepped up and the Southwest Commission has started a, a affordable housing, uh, I forget what they call it, but uh, we're leveraging and, so yeah. and we're levering funds funds for the seven seven counties, and we'll be getting part of those for the for this. So every year, seven hundred thousand every year that, that we split between the seven counties. He didn't join it. Yeah. So, and there was was there one more that I'm forgetting. That's right. Have, Hey, David's saying that we had uh, Habitat for Humanity has has a program for homeless kids, and in each, which was in the paper a couple of weeks ago, um, they're talking about the houses. I think they've built two houses, if I'm not mistaken. Is it two, Vicky? I'm looking at Vicky Hyatt back there. Each has done two houses or one? Five. Okay. Okay. <laughs> it wasn't reading too good, was it? So there's several groups that have taken on. Uh, taking on this on and primarily what our group did was we studied uh, uh, Mark what Mark Classby was our chairman and we basically uh, 
talked with uh, some groups out of Asheville, uh, their uh, affordable housing, uh, some groups from there. We talked to developers that do uh, the tax credits. And, uh, and it basically showed us that, to me, what's really important is to have water and sewer available. For, uh, for the county, for the county areas, because when you have water and sewer, you can have more density and put those homes in. And we saw when we tried to do that in Oak Park, you got the not my backyard mentality where people thought it was gonna be something that I don't believe it's what it was. It was gonna be, you know, workforce housing. It's really workforce housing more than affordable because that's what we want to be able to do is have teachers and, and our, uh, you know, firemen, policemen, and people like that that, that can, uh, afford a, a new home so but anyway we have several groups starting to do that now so yeah we're I, I'm, I mean I'm okay with it I understand uh, that everybody everybody's working on it that we, what what we did do and what we did get accomplished but I think it kind of got conversation going and all these groups have sprung up and each one of them have like a different segment that they're working on like each and and uh, habitat and then uh, the Smoky Mountain housing so Y'all didn't have a budget. This was just an advisory right. committee. Right. We had a little bit of a budget, but not much. Yeah. We met at the uh, Senior Resource Center once a month there. And you you spoke with Mark Clasby, David. Do you need to get, do you want to come up and say anything? I'll let David. David kind of helped us spearhead that. The uh, Affordable Housing Council was, uh, uh, as Frank said, was started about three years ago. And <clears throat> at that time, the uh, Affordable Housing Task Force had completed a uh, report that was given to the commissioners at that time. And, the, and out of that was the, created the Affordable Housing Task Force. And, you know, when this was started in 2018, you know, it was, uh, you, know, a, you know, I was told the group, I said, you've got a year of learning. This is a hard, complicated, there's no easy answers that we can ever do. But as Kevin mentioned about the uh, project over, over the summer in Clyde. And, and from, from those conversations, you know, things started springing up. You know, Mountain Project you know, uh, started the, uh, the Smoky Mountain uh, housing force down there. And they're presently building two houses uh, there uh, now as well. The, uh, the, the Southwest uh, Consortium that we worked on in the, the uh, spring and summer of this year uh, that we're uh, partnering with uh, the seven western counties is a HUD program. Uh, Don McGowan, that you all uh, remember, was instrumental in starting that. So the conversations that this group had in getting the word out there has really spurred a lot of things. And now, you know, it's kind of hard to say this, but, you know, there's a duplication. You know, we're, we're all chasing after very few dollars that, that, that's out there. And the, the way that Mountain Projects is, is structured in conversations that uh, Mr. Morehead and Kevin and I have had with them was about using some of the sales of the, 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 and you all have had as well too, the proceeds from the sale of the hospital to be able to form basically a land bank to where we can go and build a house, sell a house, build a house, and sell a house. And they have the mechanics to be able to do that. Uh, they have a full-time uh, general contractor on staff now. And so that helps, you know, with that. The, and so and there's, and then as you mentioned, uh, Habitat for Humanity has been in the county for a long time, uh, getting ready to start a few more houses. The EATS uh, program was uh, a great program. So there, there's there now, and we, you know, as, a, as our governmental body, we need to help support the, those folks that are out there. Um, I, and Kevin and I, we, we've been talking about this for several months about, you know, do we continue this council, you know, but there's so much more going on there that we need to be supportive of. And I, I'm working, uh, this last week started working with a, another group that is interested in doing the tax credits that, that we did for the old hospital from a Greenfield project, brand new apartments there. 
So there, there's things out there that we need to be supportive of, and I, I do think that the, um, that the task force that did serve its purpose, they, they did a, a good job, and as Kevin said, they got the conversation going. I know it, it's kind of hard to let something go that you know when you start it, but I, I think it is the appropriate thing to do at this time. Anybody have any questions, Mr. David, or anything? So I'll move to approve the resolu resolution to dissolve the Haywood County Affordable Housing Council. I'll second. Okay. Any other discussion? All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Okay, that's unanimous. Thank okay. You. Okay, thanks, Dave. Okay, item six of the regular agenda is to re request approval to appropriate $350,000 from fund balance to the non-departmental salaries and wages <coughs> the regular account and approval for county manager to distribute the funds from non-departmental account to departmental accounts to fund a 2% cost of living adjustment or a COLA <coughs> and up to 2% merit employee salary increase. The increases will be effective January 4th, 2021 and will be included in the employee checks uh, dated <coughs> January 22, 2021. Brian, you want to? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this is the item we've talked about at the last two meetings. This actually executes the, the pay increases, so we'll take 350 from fund balance, put it in a central account. We're monitoring lapsed salary by department, so I think we have about half of what the, the cost of this increase will cost. Uh, we'll spread this money by the end of, of June but as we uh, need it to various departments. Some departments will actually have already saved enough to pay for their departmental increases. Like I said, uh, everyone will get a 2% COLA effective uh, January the 4th and uh, up to a 2% merit based on performance. Okay, we talked about this when we passed the budget last year and we, wasn't sh we weren't sure what uh, COVID was gonna do to our, our <coughs> economy or local economy and but we've seen uh, in the first six months or the six months after that well almost six months four months anyway that our sales tax is coming in very high building construction is really going um, really good uh, Kirk and I can attest to that the real estate market has uh, has really uh, probably doing the best I've ever seen it do we do get revenues, I don't know if you all know this or not, from the sales tax or the excise tax off of uh, property sales and the county, uh, you pay 2% a thousand uh, and the county gets to keep 1% of that. So those, those funds I know have gone up. Our sales tax has gone up, I believe. We've had the highest months since, yeah. So, we've, so, the, so Bryant and their staff feel very comfortable in uh, giving our employees um, getting them a little bit of a raise that we weren't able to do last year. So, anybody have any comments on that? <laughs> no, I just think it's something that we've discussed. I think the last couple of meetings and something I've I've said that I'm in support of, and uh, I think it's a great thing to to keep up with uh, with the cola and and to give that extra to to those that's. Uh, performing well and uh, gives you a perfect opportunity to sit down with them and, and tell them areas they need to improve on. So uh, I think overall it's a, it's a good plan. Glad that our revenue and uh, our numbers are coming in. Did I hear you say, Julie, that it's been higher every month? Is that right? Did you say it's coming in, the excise tax? Okay, gotcha. You probably need to come up here with you. <laughs> and just, I didn't want to, I just want to clarify, it's $2 per thousand, not 2%. I didn't want people to think we're and getting right. $20 per thousand dollars. I thought that's what I said, but I didn't. Two, $2. Yeah, $2. Somebody $2. may say, thousand. what are we doing with all that money? <laughs> yeah, I guess that's point oh oh two percent We'll take the percentage. I didn't, I didn't want you to take a hit on that. Okay. <laughs> well, it's a, it's, a, it's a state tax, so <laughs> it's the state made us do it. Go ahead. <laughs> What I was going to tell you about the sales tax is the um, 1.6 million for November 
relates to in prior years, 1.4 million was always a high amount. But as the sales tax is coming in this year, as it comes in July, August, September, it's higher than last year at the July, August, September. So it is higher. We had originally expected it to be lower, but it's been higher every month. Okay. Good news. I know the excise tax I was talking about, I've gotten that information from, Sh from Sherry, the register of deeds. She collects that, I guess. And, and it's, it is higher, right? I mean. Yes, it it's looks good, too. It's what? It looks good, too. Yeah, yeah that's the one we send 50% to the state, and we keep the other 50%. Yeah. Right. Okay. Does anybody have any questions about that? Any other questions? Okay, I'll entertain a motion. We approve item six of the regular agenda. So moved. Second. Any other discussion? All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Okay, that's unanimous. Okay, uh, we'll move on to our next is appointments, and we have none tonight. Our next order of business is our closed session. It's attorney client privilege, I mean, attorney client 143 318 11 A3. And I'll entertain a motion we go into closed session. So move. Second. Hey, before we do that, do we have a reward we can give all these folks that stayed tonight? <laughs> <laughs> I do appreciate our law enforcement. We appreciate you guys. And we'll be in closed Thanks. session when we entertain who's in the back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
There we go. I want to go. Okay, we've returned from closed session. Does anybody have anything further for the board? Hearing no, I'll entertain a motion. We adjourn. So moved. Second. Hey, all in favor, say aye. 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 Okay, we're adjourned. Everybody stay safe. <laughs> Everybody stay safe. Stay safe. Stay safe.